गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन वेलकम टू ए आई सी ए आई एम ए टी इंटरनेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस फॉर आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ फाउंडर प्रेसिडेंट डॉक्टर अशोक के चौहान ऑनरेबल चांसलर डॉक्टर अतुल चौहान ऑनरेबल प्रो वाइस चांसलर डॉक्टर एन रामचंद्रन सी ओ एम ए टी मिडिल ईस्ट डॉक्टर वजाहत हुसैन ऑन द बिहाफ ऑफ इंटायर एम ए टी फैमिली आई वुड लाइक टू वेलकम ईच वन ऑफ यू फॉर दिस इंटरनेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस मैनी ऑफ हर्स मे बी दे हैव विजिटेड दुबई मोर देन वंस Dubai has a very unique uh, kind of uh, thing many of the thing uh, it is difficult to find out in other countries ministry of happiness something which is totally different the culture is now setting up for the other country also ministry of artificial intelligence it is a unique kind of ministry we will find only here with the same theme this conference has been uh, conceptualized which has been gone through with a very long cycle of approximately one year and today on behalf of amity i would like to thank each one of you because it is not possible to make it possible until your presence is not here to start with to introduce amity dubai i have a very small video of 2 to 3 minute we have a test i am going to read on it as an introduction followed by we will start this technical session sure welcome to life at amity university dubai my name is alan sinarana Welcome to life at Amity University Dubai. My name is Alan Sinarana. Our state of the art facilities is a home to a range of disciplines. Numerous extracurricular activities and a constant opportunity for growth. Floors of library books available to students 24/7 with automated self-check-in and check-out kiosks. From the funding of startups and mentorship programs, office spaces and networking opportunities, Amity's incubation center gives students. a platform to develop their business ideas and to build a sustainable life after amity so the question is are you ready to start your entrepreneurial journey do you want to turn your concepts into a rapid reality do join us at incubation center at amity university dubai be one of our startups this is a place where we come to not just about being book smart amity's advanced lab facilities give us hands on practical experience to go with theory learns in class hi my name is vaishali vaishali raj and i lead the fashion design program here at amity we offer a very very exciting degree which is a bachelor of design 
it teaches you all four steps of the growth conception ideation prototyping and finally the outcome of that brilliant design that you can think of which is unique and different here at amity we have one of the best state-of-the-art labs which is well equipped with all sorts of machinery and equipment so we look forward to seeing as many passionate and active design emerging designers and students who can come join us and give the industry a new face Student residence has housed over 250 students with an access to a gym, study space, pantry and a laundry room. Dubai. I am Aksa Khalifa and this is Amity. Good morning to all of you. Am I audible? Yeah. Good morning to all of you. We welcome all the delegates who are presented for this conference, AICI. And we welcome all because the session is going to talk about how reliable is AI. For this, we have a chair for the session. We would like to invite you, sir, Professor Dr. Ahmed T. L. Tani, PhD, MSc, BSc. Dr. Ahmed is a professor of artificial intelligence, Arabic natural language processing at the Department of Computer Science, Faculty of Information Technology and Computer Science at Yarmouk University. He has held various positions at various organizations like Vice President and Dean of the Faculty of Science at IIT, the Dara University Jordan, Director of Online Examination Unit, Yarmouk University Jordan, Dean Faculty of IT and Computer Science at the same university and many more positions. His research interests include image processing and computer vision, knowledge-based systems, Arabic language processing, Arabic character recognition, machine translation, and page classification. He has more than 70 publications on his account in reference journals and international conferences. 
He has supervised more than 50 theses and projects since 1995. I would request Dr. Ahmed to kindly join me and help me to introduce Dr. The, the speaker of the session. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Good morning, everybody. It's a nice uh, morning. I think this is the first talk in the conference, and we have to the, today or now the first invited speaker, uh, Professor uh, uh, Mine Key. He is the chairman, professor of industrial engineering, associate dean, College of Engineering, Department of Systems, Engineering and Engineering Management, City University of Hong Kong in Hong Kong. Just I will introduce Professor briefly. He asked me, told me just to be brief in introducing him actually, uh, just to give him time for his uh, speech here. <coughs> Professor uh, uh, Mine serves as editor, associate editor, and on editorial board of over 50 international journals. Also, he supervised over 35 PhD students and they are holding various positions in academia, industry, and financial uh, institutions. Uh, please uh, let me introduce Professor, uh, Professor Mine. The floor is yours. You have half an hour just to introduce your talk. After that, we will uh, give floor to my talk. I think that's really just a good time to speak to the microphone. Can you keep the light up there? It's a little bit visible. You get this bit so that we can so this is a good bit of It's okay. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizer uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity uh, to present some of my uh, thoughts. Uh, probably, uh, we could have a more uh, discussion uh, during the three days uh, conference. Uh, Actually, uh, I'm not an AI expert. I get into involved in so-called artificial intelligence only uh, several uh, months ago when I was uh, actually invited to give a talk at an uh, AI uh, event uh, uh, in China uh, because my work uh, was more related to, I did some work on software reliability, so uh, I knew uh, some friends in computer science who tried to uh, do something on um, artificial in intelligence. And they have been working on that for many years. So I saw that uh, what I could contribute. Uh, now, I have been working in reliability for many years or since I was a graduate student. Um, I mainly focus more on the data analysis and also the reliability of complex uh, systems. Um, actually, uh, this is the screen photo that I took on the flight coming to Dubai. And uh, there was a, a documentary and TED talk uh, uh, about AI. And uh, people try to develop various uh, robots for practical applications and uh, use. This is a robot trying to open a door. And as you can see that in the lab environment, everything works very well. But when they put those uh, uh, robots in the real situation, uh, they got a lot of problems. The robot fell, and then the robot had to be carried away because it's too heavy. Uh, I'm also very happy to know that uh, in UAE, they had the world's first minister of artificial intelligence. So I think that this is a, 
a very nice opportunity to have this uh, conference here. Now, back to uh, the content of my talk. As I said, uh, I have been thinking quite a bit about the reliability of AI. Uh, I'm not going to present a solution, but some discussion probably we can work together uh, to develop something that could be useful in our real life situation. Now, I started my graduate uh, study in the 80s. Uh, at that time, uh, people were talking about automation. So uh, automation will help us in our work and in our life. Now today, people talk about big data and AI. So what is the relationship between AI, big data, and automation? So in my opinion, although people don't talk about automation very much today as uh, for 20, 30 years ago, I still feel that uh, the automation should be the import, most important objective. So how do you achieve the objective? Uh, we use artificial intelligence. And then to do that, we need to have data and information. So data is probably the important the input AI, could be the technology, and automation should be the objective. OK? Now, just to share with you some of my personal experience, uh, uh, I started my uh, undergrad study in physics. But I was more interested in mathematics. So I was in department of physics, but I studied mathematics. And then I became interested in statistics, and I wanted to work on more real problem. So at that time, uh, I was introduced to the field of reliability engineering. And uh, they had the first professor in a university, but the professor was in mechanical engineering. So I actually went to the mechanical engineering department for my doctorate study. But in the mechanical engineering department, people heard that I was working on reliability. But when I talked to them, they said that, you know, we don't need your help. I was in a city called Ling Shopping. They have a sub uh, automobile company. And sub is also a company that make a fighter, make a small passenger plane. And the system is very much mechanical. On the other hand, when they introduce more software to the system, they had a lot of problems. So in mechanical engineering department, I was introduced to the problem of the reliability of software. So I started uh, focusing more on reliability of uh, software. And in fact, if you really think about uh, uh, the uh, mechanical engineering department. There were many people working on robotics. And we had a very strong robotics group. And in fact, to design and make a robot is not a problem. It's, you know what you want robot to do, you just build it. But the most difficult part was to write a program to control the robot. So the mechanical engineering professor in robotics, they were struggling writing programs together with students. Students were not properly trained to write uh, computer code in mechanical engineering department. So that's why there were a lot of problems with the software program they, they, uh, they developed. And also, we had a very strong uh, the, uh, simulation uh, group because when you design a new car, you had to do a lot of testing, and it's very expensive. So the whole design and testing process could be simplified, or the cost could be reduced if you could use simulation to design the product and test it, right? So they developed a lot of CAD CAM system. But again, they had a lot of software problem. OK, so then I saw that, you know, I'm not really a computer scientist. I'm not really a computer engineer. So who am I? I started to get into 
system engineering because for any complex system, you need to have a software and hardware and even humans involved. And I visited some companies, uh, there are many companies uh, developing autonomous driving cars, but uh, there is actually a company just across border in um, uh, Shenzhen, and uh, the bus company actually work with uh, others to develop autonomous driving buses. And you can see that uh, they actually install a lot of sensors, they develop a lot of algorithms, and uh, I visit them twice, one year apart. Uh, the development is not as fast as you probably have read in reports and so on. In five years, we will see buses, cars without a driver. And the difficulty is how to deal with the system. Okay, so again, uh, this is basically, uh, I try to introduce myself as well. I was born in China, but I went to Sweden for my undergraduate study in 79, and I stayed there for 13 years. And then uh, in the middle, there's a one line from 1991 to 2011. I was with uh, National University of uh, Singapore, uh, and I moved to City University of Hong Kong and uh, at that time, the university was trying to, you know, increase uh, the reputation and uh, uh, improve the ranking. And you can see that our university now is probably the best engineering uh, school in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, it's, uh, it's three or four, depending on how you measure that. Uh, and also, I have been working in different fields from uh, software, statistics, uh, quality, and uh, uh, systems. I uh, want to see how much time I have. Uh, in fact, uh, this is also uh, a talk that I usually give to tell the students how I started working on software reliability. I will uh, cut this short. Uh, so basically, uh, I was uh, given a project by the professor, and this is supported by the uh, other car company, Volvo, and basically they want us to estimate uh, if we extend the warranty from one year to three years, what is the expected number of replacement. They will provide free replacement, and then they can calculate the cost of the warranty. So basically, we need to solve this uh, integral equation. It looked very simple, right? S but there was a problem. When you integrate, you try to divide this into many intervals and calculate the area of those rectangles. And you reduce the width of the rectangle, and you will get closer result to the area under the curve. But the problem was uh, the convergence was very slow because this density function could have singularity. So basically, if you try to integrate this, you will have uh, zero times infinity. So f is a distribution function. F, this small f is a density function. mt is the number of replacements from zero to t. So this is the theory behind that I will uh, skip. But uh, I tried many methods and talked to people in computer science and talked to people in mathematics. Mathematicians try to get a close solution, which is very uh, difficult. Uh, the computer science people, they use very advanced methods, such as uh, approximation, finite element methods, and the program was very, very complicated. I thought that this is a simple equation. Why we have this problem? And then, after getting into a lot of trouble, and I give this up, but one day, I saw that uh, what is the density function? The density function is the distribution function differentiated with x, right? So you can write fx dx as dfx. So by doing so, this distribution function is very smooth. It's increasing. It goes from 0 to 1, it's bonded. It has no singularity problem. So I rewrote this equation and uh, discretized it and came up with a very simple method. Actually, let's skip this. This is, uh, we can have a recursive 
uh, procedure. So I was uh, uh, the pro program was uh, written in the uh, 80s, so the program language was simple, basic language, and I had some problem publishing this paper, but it was eventually published in this journal. And I gave this up, and uh, 10 years after that, uh, I met some people at conferences. Uh, his, it's an electrical engineering conference. They were using this method for some signal processing equation. And then the guy said that, oh, you are, are you M here who wrote uh, this paper? It was very, very easy to use. I say that, uh, you know, you don't work in this field. How did you come across this paper? I tried to publish it in mathematics journal. They rejected my paper. I tried to publish it in computer science journal. They say that uh, they can't believe it's true. Okay? So they rejected the paper. But they, they say that, you know, they found my paper in the MATLAB central file exchange. So this is the site where you can download a lot of uh, programs uh, in MATLAB free. So I went inside and it's very, very simple. And this uh, procedure uh, is very, very fast and you don't really need to have a large, small step length. Okay? So basically, um, the company liked it very much. So we did not write a report. We gave them the program. They uh, send the money to the university. So my experience myself was this. Okay? The software packages, uh, subroutines, and algorithms are not reliable. So we cannot simply rely on a third-party software for your system use. Now, uh, again, uh, don't uh, sidetrack too much. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, reliability of AI. So the first thing uh, is, how do we define reliability of AI? And uh, I have seen many people try to introduce new definition and new concepts uh, very often, I'm against that. I think that people should uh, try to unite and bridge the gap. And uh, for AI, we don't really need a new definition. Uh, reliability is basically the probability that you have no failure during the usage. So when you use it for one hour or three hours or one year, okay, what is the probability that you will have no failure? Now, of course, you have uh, sometimes one uh, mission to complete, and that is the static reliability. So the one I was actually talking about is more like a dynamic reliability. So we can extend and uh, uh, adjust the definition for specific application. So the definition, when people ask me this, I say that you know we don't need to introduce a new definition for uh, reliability of AI, but uh, look at uh, the standard textbook. Uh, the reason is, we can also ask, is AI a software or hardware or what? Now, to many people, in fact, AI, uh, it's more like a software than hardware. And also, AI, many people working uh, in AI, have a lot of friends working on that, they develop algorithm okay so algorithm is not software so you have to convert your algorithm to code that you can use in the hardware so usually I say that you know uh, it really depends on what you need to be uh, delivered okay so if you are a developer, you want to check what the customer wants from you. And then if you purchase some service and software, you also need to be more specific what you want the software to do. So we can say that AI is a kind of product or function or system. I tend to use the word system because uh, it can be defined broadly. So for any of these things, we can specify the probability that we will have no failure. So that is the reliability definition. Uh, the other thing is that you probably have seen uh, uh, this type of uh, whatever. You, when you click it, it 
it's still stable, okay? So uh, they say that uh, the uh, AI has been uh, used in this type of uh, application. But is this the application of AI or demonstration of AI? How many minutes? Uh, Okay, so that's what I was. <laughs> uh, now, uh, in fact, people develop a lot of hardware for others to demonstrate the AI. Okay, in reliability, the complexity is a critical issue. So all the reliability problems are caused by system complexity. So if you have this type of system, you know, uh, not to talk about the wiring and hardware, and uh, there are a lot of sensors. And in addition to the code, the algorithm. So if you really develop a product and study the reliability of this, what can you do? To me, if I'm asked to do that, I just feel that uh, they are making things more difficult and more complicated than necessary. Now, there are also a lot of people talking and discussing about uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, how reliable is that. Now, we can actually look at things from various different angles, from the product, service, and uh, system. And uh, this is also related to uh, what I mentioned uh, for the autonomous uh, dr driving. And, uh, to study this type of system, uh, we really need to consider many, many uh, factors. I see, uh, okay. Uh, I, I don't have a, a, a picture about that. Now, to use AI, we need to have a lot of data. And usually people assume that we have a lot of data. And in fact, we do have a lot of data from different sources. But very often, the important parameters, important uh, aspect of the measurements may not be there or may not be accurate. So people actually install a lot of sensors to get data. Uh, last year, uh, there was an aircraft crash uh, in Indonesia, the uh, Lion Air, and it's a very new Boeing aircraft, just two, three months old. And usually, this type of system will be very reliable. But the cost was, okay, the Boeing installed a sensor in the aircraft, and the sensor gave wrong reading, and then the pilot and the system could not control the aircraft properly. So if you have this type of issue, how reliable is AI? So this is really a challenging question and issue. Uh, many people compare AI and uh, humans and uh, see whether the human will be replaced by AI. But actually, we also talk about human reliability. So while I'm questioning the reliability of AI, and we need to really pay attention to it from the uh, beginning, okay, don't wait until you have the product. Oh, what is the reliability? Because in my uh, 30 years of research, a lot of people ask, uh, try to ask me how reliable is this product. I say this product is not designed to achieve the reliability. So now you ask me and ask me to verify that it is reliable enough. How can I do that? So if we have human reliability problem, AI also has similar problem, and then we can actually compare when we should use AI, when we should rely on humans. Okay, I have, uh, again, this is uh, another uh, screenshot that I took, and it's very interesting, and uh, you know, you can see that the speaker himself wants to develop something. His leg was uh, amputated, and he wants to make sure that uh, the uh, the uh, AI can really help him to feel the things, not uh, separate the foot and the brain. 
uh, I will try to run through how to analyze the uh, system reliability. There are many tools and methods, and uh, I don't want to spend too much time to talk about uh, those things. But again, we can use traditional methods. We can develop a new uh, data analytics uh, methods, and we can also incorporate uh, any additional factors during the system analysis. Okay, so some of the books that I wrote about uh, uh, software reliability, the first book was published in 1991. Okay, so the other book was a little bit uh, later. So I consider the reliability of AI as an important system that we can uh, analyze and study. Okay, so that's all I have uh, prepared to share with you. And uh, just one announcement. Okay, so this uh, June we will uh, organize a conference uh, in reliability and the conference will be chaired by our uh, university uh, president and uh, we will consider all the issues relevant to reliability analysis of especially of systems so thank you very much thank you professor mai uh, now we have the uh, floor for questions, maybe two or three short questions, please. Please be brief in your question. Okay, there. Uh, thank you, Professor Ming. My name is Actor. I'm very happy to hear this reliability, but just my uh, short question is that reliability is a journey on the time to fine tune the knowledge and then gradually come to know some of the problem that we hardly can see now, but in the future they will come. So do you still think that AI and reliability is really a matter or AI will win over reliability? Thank you. Okay, so in fact, uh, is this working? Yeah, okay, so in fact, I say that uh, in reliability, we can define static reliability and dynamic reliability. So if we talk about the time, then it's a dynamic aspect. Uh, now, I always feel that AI should help human. Okay, so uh, it really depends on how we, uh, you know, incorporate AI in our system. And also, when never people develop a product at the end, we should ask how reliable is the system. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question? You are lucky. No more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for the wonderful session. Now we request our honorable chair, sir, to kindly come forward. Along with, I would also like to request Dr. Ajay Rana, sir, who is the organizing chair and general chair of this conference, to present the certificate and the prestigious memento to Professor Z. I'd like to felicitate our chair of the session. Thank you very much. Big appreciations to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we have got uh, Another interesting session where we have our honorable chair as Professor Kenji Ozawa, University of Yamanashi, Japan. Professor Kenji Ozawa received the PhD in Electrical Communication from Tohoku University, Japan. He is currently a professor of the graduate faculty of Interdisciplinary Research, University of Yamanashi. His research interests include psychotics, signal processing of audio signals, 
and effective information processing. Recently, he received the Best Paper Award of IEEE GCCE 2016, GCCE 2017, and IEICE ISS 2018. Professor Ozawa is on the board directors of the Acoustical Society of Japan. I would request you all to kindly help me welcoming in Professor Ozawa. Please, sir. Thank you. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session uh, entitled uh, Keynote and Invited Talk 4. Uh, we'd like to, oh, I'm Kenji Ozawa from Japan. Um, we will have uh, the pro uh, invited talk of Professor S.N. Singh. Uh, the uh, title is Intelligent System Applications in Solving Engineering Problems. And, <laughs> Professor Singh is uh, the member of FIEEE, FNAE, FIET, FIE, and FIETE. Mm. And he is the Vice Chancellor, Madam, Madam, Madam Moham Mariona University of Technology uh, in India. So, please. Thank you. So good morning to all of you. Well, I'll also add one, you can say one string, the previous speaker. I'm also not core worker in AI techniques, but my role is to apply these techniques for solving the engineering problems. I am basically from the electrical engineering, where we do optimization for each every task, for every level. And then we found the various difficulties by having our conventional techniques. Also, it was found, even though I started working on genetic algorithm long back in 90s, when I was a PhD scholar, and I applied for my thesis work, and finally I skipped, and you can say I left. I found that is not applicable to my problem, and finally I didn't pursue in this. But later stage we find, and various developments were taken place, and then its role and importance becomes very, very useful for my application as well. So I'll discuss, and mostly the students get confused, that there are a variety of tools, variety of AI techniques, which one to apply, which and where to apply. We found, being a, I'm very much associated with the IEEE in the various forums, even though I'm the DL for the Power Engineering Society as well as the Industry Application Society. And I found the people are just solving a simple problem, they apply AI techniques. And they say, look, my technique is better than others' techniques without having the valid proof. So these are the various challenges nowadays. No doubt, every, this is the ACE for data science, ACE for machine learning, ACE for all these AI techniques that is basically required, but at the same time, we are very much sure, and we should guide our student, our researcher, that's where to move and where to apply these techniques. So my whole presentation is related to this, and I know all the stalwarts sitting in this room, by even though some of the slides are very general, and I'll try to skip those one, but I'll try to fix some of the things where we can, what are the real challenge in applying this intelligent system application. We all know, once our, the first, the various techniques of intelligence system is started the artificial intelligence. Many people are sitting in the room also, may not agree to write the artificial word, and the very people said, no, it should not be artificial, because it is giving a real problem solution, it is giving the real words, why to name the artificial? 
but the artificial name was taken for the artificial neural network because it was conceived from the mind's brains or any living being brains and then it was just copied in the similar way to perform the same task. Later various other algorithms were developed and you can see most of the algorithms here are related of basically the copied are basically learned from the living things. For example, you can say the evolution techniques, all the evolution techniques are nothing but the how the life is changing, how these people evolve in the nature. So it is related to like their genetic algorithms or you can say differential evolution, it is a basically evolution theory. And based on that, we basically get the solution of the engineering problems. This new development as particle form optimization, that is also one of the very, very important and very simple, but it has also a limitation. And also it is giving very good solution, but only we have to see where to apply and how to apply. Support vector machine, expert system was very beginning because we were taking the knowledge of the experts, those are working in the various industries, various places, if that we can apply, certainly we can arrive where the very difficult solutions were, solution is um, almost impossible. The fuzzy logic, ant colony, bacteria foraging, many, many more, all are basically the family of intelligence systems. Even though in the terms of naming, I know the from very beginning, some people are very hardcore against to the AI applications. If they write the paper, people simply, if it will go to them, they will say reject it. If it will go in the another domain where those are liking, because both type of people in this world liking and disliking of AI techniques. But we should be very careful and we should be very cautious that if really this AI applications are giving the better solution, then we should why not adopt, why not to promote. To one of the big people always challenge that if you are having the conventional method to solve your problem, now I mean the solution is mostly in this competitive ways to optimize your op product, optimize your value. So whole life is optimization for anyone. Even though you are designing any product and it is so bulky or rugged, it is ugly, nobody will buy. So we have to optimize in terms of cost, in terms of material, in terms of anything. So optimization is always goal in all the part of the engineering. That's why I say the engineering and technology is the application of sciences. Where using those science concepts, we try to develop our product or whatever we are going in this. So the optimization, so we'll find the various techniques are there in this already the hardcore mathematicians, they proof it and there is a proof. So the intelligent system applications, if you see this started the neural network, I'll quickly, it started long back, but it was having also ups and downs and the finally it's arrived and it is giving a very, very good examples for the various works that you can, you can see all this history it started somewhere in 1943 and it was basically came in somewhere in 70s. Because in between there was some problem in the artificial neural network, it's just like a mapping. You are having input and output, no model inside, you can map with your past data and then you can get your output. So once you are giving for unknown patterns, output is very easily seen. So the various phases, even though ANN also gone, and finally it has come at this level that almost everywhere like pattern recognitions, even though finger identification, face recognitions, many, many applications we are having even for forecasting. These techniques are very widely used nowadays in this whole application. So this is a basically history. I think uh, this was basically made for the students. The students are very limited, so I'm just uh, simply I'm assuming. But I'll come in the core problems where we can see. You will see why it is artificial, the term I was using, because we took this artificial intelligence from the biological. So the biological neurons, it is believed that we are having 10 to the power 15 interconnections, 10 to the power 10 neurons in our brains, and based on that we are just, and it is so fast, and so even active and accurate, based on that you can see already here, uh, this difference, it is your biological neurons and this is artificial, so it is a mapping. So you can say biological neurons are mapped to the artificial, but not up to that level because we are having the limited neurons, we are limited connections, and based on that we are doing the processing. But our brains are, it is believed that it is having use, and based on that we are performing. So the people started working with this concept, and the various models were proposed for the several world, and you can see the various neural networks are in the literature, you will find the various books are available, those are the various here, based on either you are classifying based on the learning techniques, based on the neuron interactions, or maybe the based on the various 
activation functions are based on the layers. So it was complete classification which was there and the various applications people use. Now coming to this here, you will find this is your uh, learning algorithms, various type of the learning algorithms are here and these are the basically the part of your nothing but intelligence system applications. Based on the neuron structures, you will find that even though here this multi-layer is very popular, we are having the bi-directional self-organizing maps, various type of people have worked and but the, some of the special neural networks nowadays are very popular and people are trying to focus and it is mapping your problem so accurately especially those three here they are there they are already well established and the people are using for the very simple applications it is very well working but nowadays people are also talking about the wavelet neural because the activation functions are changed with the wavelengths and also here people are talking with the quantum neural networks and cellular neurons just like a brain but only the success is not up to that extent people are doing a very hard work and hopefully for the certain applications already it is in the place you will find the various literature but the later you will find that it is, a, it is a, people are going to work hard and up to this extent already the people have done very excellent work but here also people are doing and I hope in the future this it will come back again. Various applications already I said applications are many many more. As I said, people are applying some of the tools for the small applications, some of the applying for very concurrent problem and it was found that the various you can say the classification also we can use, we can use for forecasting and the estimation. Calculation we cannot use but for the estimation these neural networks are also very valid and the forecasting is one of the very, very important where control applications. Now it is a, even the, along with the neural network, along with the fuzzy that is combined together and NFACE neural networks are very, very popular in the, even the washing machines they are also using. So these are the various applications, recognitions, printed matters, those are neural networks are very widely used. Another is evaluation programming because the neural networks are not good for the optimization. But as I said, most of the engineering problems are so difficult, so nonlinear, so complex. To solve it, it is creating a lot of problem because our conventional methods are unable to give the solution. So we are moving some non-conventional and that we call the intelligent system applications or AI based techniques. In that first is evaluation techniques and we all know that here this various popular methods are there that is and it is also related with the Darwinian theory how this progression of the human being our living beings came up to this existence and using those philosophy those philosophy that is the evolution techniques were developed. Now people define the computational intel intelligence you can see by this one it is better. You can see now this various techniques and merge one or two or three together you are having the new techniques and they are better and they are giving the good solution. So like you can see the computational intelligence also is the same as the soft computing or intelligence system. The names are different but again you will find that people are very invariably using the various names. You can see immune system, swarm intelligence, fuzzy systems, you want to see computing and the neural network. So mix this you are getting other different. So the different type of people are giving in this literature one uh, figure is this, second is also you can say the mixing together solving our complex problem and you can say also this is known as a computational intelligence. The various popular university techniques again you know always we are keen to develop new and new tools based on the fundamental. So you can see the genetic algorithms is used the first one it was derived long back somewhere in the 80s it came and after that people are keep on refining and at the same time keep on changing in terms of either crossover, mutation, the binary using or hexadecimals various things they are using and the various systems they have approached and for the different applications no doubt they are good enough and also giving the better solution. So you can see the how the genetics thus it believe that the people started in the the stone age and finally reached with the computers and that is the basically evolution of the system and using this philosophy whole optimization is done. Only this in optimization you can say there's two techniques are there one is the calculation based another is the immunity based scheme. All the calculator based schemes require derivatives but there are the various functions has no derivative, derivative and they are not having the derivative at all like a discrete functions or they do not have the function at all. All these things where your conventional method fails and once fails how to get your optimal design and then people thought why not we can move we can go to have this uh, intelligent system application they can give a solution but again there is a no guarantee to get the optimal solution because there is no proof. 
because always they are based on the certain probability, they are based on certain random values, and finally, once you are running, always you are getting a different domain that is called the confidence level. But as I said, if you are not having solution, you can go for the these technique. Now the people talk why, even so earlier people why they were not using genetic algorithm, why we are talking all this machine learning and other things. What were the problems with those conventional methods? At that time, we were also getting the solution, but with the great approximation. And with the great approximation, what we are doing, we are assuming my function is a continuous, my function is a derivative, my constraints are derivatives, all the things, even though we are starting with a very close initial guess, and then we were getting the solution. Now, people are saying, you look, the computers are so fast, why need to approximate? Why not we can model the real problems in the real systems? And once you are having, so it is going to be very, very complex, n-dimensional, and the finally, then it is very, very difficult to have the exact problem in the continuous or in terms of a functionality. Those are not available then. It is better if you are going in that side, exact modeling, then there is no other option left. You have to apply the AI-based techniques. Those are basically existing. Only the problem, that is it is the multi-pass search. It is searching like uh, conventional methods, go by one step to one step and get the solution. But these are the multi-pass search where you can move and parallel processing can be adapted. Computers are very fast and we can get the solution very fast. But only the problem in the multi-pass search guaranteed to get the exact solution is limited. But we can reach too near the global solution and that is where there is no solution. I want my design, my product which is very close to optimality. And once it is there, so that people are, that is why these techniques are going to be very, very popular and we are using very extensively. Genetic algorithms, we know, we have a very variety of the systems. We, you know, it is a starting with the initial population, random search, it has a operators, it has a selection, crossover, mutations, all these things are moving and there's various refinements. Means best solutions, worst solution, combined together, get another problems, another solutions, and so on and so forth. So you can say based on that, the various aspects of the GA, that is, is a multi-pass search, a fitness function may not require and only the concern is the handling of the constraints. These methods, if you are having the equality constraints, there's a, normally what we do, we normally penalize the objective function and that penalty function is another concern. In the conventional methods, Lagrange multiplier is very well and we use it. So, there are some concerns but still people have developed some tools, some ways are there to handle all these concerns also. But if your variables are very large, these methods taking a longer time, may take a day, may take a month, it depending on the problems. So all these things are there, that's why people are trying to parallel processing, fast computers are there, now the fraction of seconds, just press the key, the optimality solutions are coming. So the, we keep on working for all these things as well. Now this is the various methods, you can say the various and various techniques of the simple GA, the, we are having the variety of the GA small changes to improve, to get the better solution people have developed and the various ways. I think the charging is required here. It is saying the low battery. Yeah, somewhere you see. Okay, I think, I don't know who has switched off. No, charge. Yeah, okay. So, Another is evolutionary programming, as I said. Evolutionary algorithms are the various here. Here, the small change you can say instead of crossover, here is used the competition. So, small, small changes we did, and some new techniques were developed. Then we went for the evolutionary stress D. Then we went for the genetic programming. Here, the fixed length is not fixed length. Other genetics, normally we were using the binary, and then is the length was fixed, and best we were commutating. Here, they are saying you can have the variable, and then it is called genetic programming. So various techniques and classifier system have developed and they are in place and they are giving the better solutions. Only again always I remind you have to be very careful where to apply and why to apply at that one and that is basically. Now another is support vector machine. Always I think why we call it some machine. Because sometimes the machines must be rotating. Always we say because in electrical engineering with a machine means it must be a rotation part. But here in this techniques, is there is no rotation. But this support vector machine is known based on the two vectors parallelly and they can move in so that we can maximize the distance between two vectors and that is why it is known as the support vector machine. 
Here what we do, if there is a, it is better to understand a kernel function, I think one example here I'll quote. Let's suppose here, we are having this one figure, I want to have a linear line to separate the red and blue balls. It is not possible to separate because then we can see here the dotted lines can only separate the blue and red balls together. So in this concept what we do, we try to have another functions to map in a such a way to change in the feature space that the phi of these dots will be such that the red will be one side and the blue will be one side and this line you can say it is separating linearly and that is the concept of the, now we treat this as a vector because a line which can separate. Now to understand why it is called support vector machine, you can say the various dots are here by after the feature space because it's a linear line can be there. You can say this line can be very easily separating it. You can say these lines are also separating. So the separation is there and finally you can find that there is a possibility the two dotted line is the maximum it is a separating and the two machines vectors they are moving so that we can maximize and that is called the support vector machine. So basically that is the support vector machines, various types of support vector machines are also there. Another is the swarm optimization. This is also you can say it is invent, invented by the one uh, uh, electrical engineer and other social uh, psychologist in 1955 and this is only 40 line codes can solve your big problems and that is why it has basically going in the and moving. You can say people say why the animals move in the jungles, why the flocking of the birds go in this flocking, why the swamps and the fishes in the ponds are moving together and this and that. Based on this task, it was decided that why not we can take our own experience and other experience and move in a such way to get the optimality and that is the swamp optimization. To understand that the time is less, the only one equation is to be solved and this, this equation is to be solved, you can say and so simple. Just but no doubt there is some random variables based on the machine. To understand here this animation is very, very clear. Suppose I want to reach the global here, this very dark point and these are my swamps and that's every iteration with the solving those equations if I'll move, you can see I'll just click every time how they are moving and you can say the finally they have reached to the very near to the global, not at this red point, you can say very close, many particles have reached it. And this is the objective I said, if you cannot get the optimal solution, if you are reaching to that near one, that is also a our satisfaction and that is basically the beauty of this optimization. There are various, various techniques and various comparisons are here that is very good and that is giving but only and the various variants are also there. I am not going to talk because many people are there. Various other techniques are also there. They are basically the living to something real time problems and but the only at the end I want to say the point should be noted first is the right tool to write application. People say how to know which is the right tool and where to apply. It is based on your experience, based on your problems, you have to read something and then you have to decide. Use the conventional methods wherever possible. What happens people say look, even though sometimes I have seen in the papers people the conventional methods and their AI technique. They say look my AI technique is better than my conventional methods, I say how come? Because there is a proof. Optimality if the uh, conventional methods are giving it is optimal, it is a proof is there. Your method there is no proof and then they say it is a better. So always in the claim you should be very, very careful. Very, very careful unless until you are proving your results with the, some proven example functions then only you can say my tool is there. That is one of the concern. Be sure before claiming the results and compare with the other intelligent techniques. What happens? I want to compare the GA with the PSO. We found, I will say, because the GA also the tuning of the parameters are there, PSO also tuning up parameters there. What people do? They take any rough, any garbage data of this one and they tune ours and then they compare. Look, mine is better. Always be very, very careful in the claiming because the other person is also able to tune. So that's why the claim is also very, very important. But it has a very vast potential for the R&D applications and that's why it is the AI is moving and the future is the AI I believe because the machines are so fast, learning is so fast and techniques are developed so fast will give you a new future to our life. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm sure for May we have some questions? Same uh, going to a certain direction and they go for the optimization. Yeah. But actually the question is that 
from uh, uh, how they are going to f uh, in the same point? Uh, basically, uh, in this here, what happens? There is one function. I think I showed you. In this function, this is the, we are solving here. How uh, you can see? This is the equation where the movement, the velocity, and the positions, the basically related to this function. Where no doubt there is a random variables here, the random one and random two. So. Only the concern I can say, if you run this even the equation all the time in your machine, because machine randomness is generated, you will get the different solutions. So, but what we do there, we use some adaptiveness. If the best solution is to keep it and then keep on running for many times and then confidence level in that, you can say. You see, even though this problem also I showed, it has not reached to the red, rod, red dark. Because once you keep on running, you may reach at that one. It was only animation, so it was equation was showing. So, you have to be very careful and choosing these parameters even C1, W and C2 is also important. It is not so just you can take any value. If you take the wrong value, you are gone somewhere else. So, that is basically it is experience. That is why I say very carefully you should tune the parameters. Sir, how can we uh, estimate the parameters? I think we will talk later on on this issue because this is another research. Huh? Yeah. And we are getting the same solution. Uh. I have done some work earlier uh, around 10 years back and uh, I was stuck. I have a fitness function and that time nonlinear uh, fitness function and nonlinear constraints. Yeah. So it was a big problem for me that time yeah. and I was not able to solve that. So then I go to traditional method of the mathematics then I solve that. Can you suggest I have uh, used P search okay. sometime. No, in that what I the statement I made. The my major concern is that what happens you are applying for the new problem with a certain technique. Yeah. That technique here you are saying better and you have taken another technique here to verify it. And you say mine is better others is wrong. So, what happens if this technique is proven somewhere and the example is there is a better your technique also proof for that. And you show this is the better yours is better then we, we can believe that this will be also better for this problem as well. Then you can say it is my claim is better. That's why I am saying the we should be very. So I. That's why I said, sir, many times people will simply. For example, suppose I am getting a problem. Is f uh, the function? This x minus one is square. Just you have to minimize it. And applying the AI have no fun. And there will be titles yeah. The that's why I am saying very very careful. That's why I said these are the people are unnecessary with blind eyes. They are applying. That should not be there. You. you have to see where we have to apply. That is the one challenge. Thank, Thank you, so you much, very sir. much. Thank you so much. Thank you for the wonderful session, sir. Uh, I would request our chair session, Kenzi Uzawa, sir, to kindly step forward. Also, I would request Dr. Ajirana, sir, to kindly step forward and help me in facilitating our speaker. Sir, may we request you to be It's not. One minute, one minute. Now we are about to start our next session. 
it is on neural computing approach for ad diagnosis hybrid ontogenetic ontogenetic neural networks based solutions and the chair of this session is professor sn singh however the introduction is not necessary because he has actually given a very good insight about the power systems but i would like to formally introduce professor shri nivas singh vice chancellor madan mohan malviya university of technology gorakhpur vice chancellor phd electrical power systems iit kanpur he has got publications about in 180 reputed journals he has got lifetime achievement for significant contribution to energy field 2018 he is in ieee vc technical activities 2019 and ieee india council chair 2019 ieee ias distinguished lecturer 2019 to 2010 and i would like to invite you sir to chair the session please welcome him with a good round of applause speaker of the day yeah but anybody that has can i invite uh, uh, using the internet speak like head of competitive okay. this is the information we have okay. if she has more okay. citation yeah. we can ask yeah so uh, let us uh, welcome for the third session professor dra carmen dras souresh arajau yeah. you are here yeah you are very big name and uh, uh, you are the head of the computational neuroscience research division director of intelligence computing Uh, big data research group and uh, i believe that can you introduce two lines about yourself because bio data is not there and then you can start okay. thank you very thank much thank you so yeah. much yeah. Uh, uh, i don't i don't know but uh, have you heard me oh, this is okay What is this? Is this and the pointer? Yeah, this is the pointer. The pointer. This is next. Yes, this is next. Okay. This, this is, is back, okay. and this is the this point. Is okay. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My first word was uh, to say thank you so much to the Amity University for this kind invitation, and the Professor Sunil Kumar. for uh, tell me and uh, that give me this opportunity to be here in a very pretty place and university so um i don't know if i need to stay here to to hear me if i move in you hear me yes okay thanks or because i i i prefer to to walk around i would like to speak uh, to to introduce some aspect concerning with the use of computational intelligence in the problem of diagnosis of a very uh, important problem that is uh, diagnosis of dementia um, nowadays the population of pyramid is changing like you can see in this uh, uh, picture and with this changing the problem is that the aging related to disease different chronic diseases like uh, dementia is also increased and the dementia is one of the major social sanitary challenges of our societies at the moment and many people think that dementia is an emergent and uncontrolled epidemic of nowadays if we analyze some numbers you can find a very high increase of number of people with dementia between for example 2010 and 2050 three point more and speaking in a uh, cost in 2010 the cost is around the 1% of gross domestic product 
in the United States, and the cost in 2015 is around uh, 800 uh, million of dollars. And it's very important um, numbers. And the most important thing for me is the quality of life of the people. Not only for the patients, but even for the familiar and caregivers person related with this. The most prevalent uh, disease or dementia is Alzheimer's disease and is a um, progressive disorder. And when you take into account the uh, stage of a symptomatic uh, situation, the progressive dis disorder can be during 15 years or more. And now, in the last resort, the Alzheimer disease can consider it like a continuum. But you can find different stages for studying this uh, disease, this asymptomatic, preclinical, one uh, theoretical construction is mild cognitive impairment, and finally, the dementia onset. You also can find other kind of dementia, like vascular dementia, levy body, and so on and so on. And a very important thing is in the, the first place where the people report cognitive impairment normally is in the primary care uh, uh, scope. And keep in your mind this data because it's very important uh, from my point of view. The interesting thing is try to diagnose dementia, essentially AD, in early stage. Because of this, we can speak about, oh, sorry, the detection of mild cognitive impairment. The mild cognitive impairment patients, normally, more than 10%, when you, we are speaking about clinical sample, convert to Alzheimer's disease, essentially Alzheimer's disease, but can convert to another kind of de dementia, is between 10 and 12 percent per year. And because of this, the early detection is very interesting aspect. Why? Because if you can obtain reliable mild cognitive impairment diagnosis, you can find many benefits. Essentially, two benefits. The first one is to improve the early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, and the second one is the possibility to manage the Alzheimer's disease in a more uh, reliability aspect and giving more quality of life to the people. But this is a complex task. Why? Because there are many aspects in which we haven't uh, enough knowledge to manage. There are important aspects concerning with the definition of mild cognitive impairment, with the border between mild cognitive impairment and dementia, with the number of type of crit diagnosis criteria to use it, and so on and so on. And normally, in primary care stage, the only di diagnostic criteria used to detect MCI are neuropsychological tests or the information given by the caregivers or even for the uh, patient. In a summary, when we are managing with the dementia problem, you can find three important aspects. One of them is the wide spectrum of diagnostic criteria different between and even the, for the same pathology for the different group of patients, the coincidence between the different diagnosis criteria is only of around 5% of coincidence. The patients that can exhibit signs of several dimensions, and finally, for the AD accurate diagnosis, we must use post-mortem diagnosis. Why? Because there aren't or there isn't no biomarker for AD at present, a specific biomarker. Because of this, 
new methods to assist diagnosis are needed. Uh, new methods, clinical methods, of course, but there are many compute, computational solutions using intelligent computing, for instance, and with the loosening of the deep learning at the moment, you can find different possibilities and different proposals. I would like that you take in your mind, keep in your mind, some results like this. For example, using deep learning technique, the problem that I am presenting, detecting early detection or differential uh, diagnosis of dementia, using deep learning, using neuroimaging, the result obtaining in this case are not so high. It depends on the problem, but accuracy in the 56% when it's in detecting last mild cognitive impairment and early mild, mild cognitive impairment. And you can find other results, but using very hard machine learning processes, deep learning. Our proposal is to use computational intelligence in order to get more knowledge about early and differential diagnosis. How? Using, using essentially hybrid neural architectures and neural ensembles, okay? Working with data and decision fashion scheme. A uh, hybrid neural network, our previous speaker uh, in, in this talk was a very a nice introduction of, about different techniques. And the hybrid neural uh, network is not a monolithic neural network, it's made up with different modules and with different techniques because of this can be hybrid or not. Can be considered a natural inspiration because the brain are composed by complex modules cooperating among them, using incremental learning. In this case, we, we can work with learning modularization, learning layer by layer, for example, and combine different techniques. In this aspect, we propose to use two kinds of architecture, human as architecture, it's a neural architecture developed by, for in, in my research group, and the paradigmatic artificial neural network, CPN, the counter-propagation artificial neural network. And in addition to this, we will use neural network ensembles, and with this uh, uh, system, it's very important because when you find and very complicated input space, or a very complicated problem, in order to find the appropriate border, the appropriate uh, uh, surface for separating different classes, you can uh, define, or you can use different kind of artificial neural network, and finally you can find the complex border for the different uh, the separation of the different classes. The important thing when you are working with neural network ensembles is to use true strategy. The first strategy is the strategy for generating the ensemble members. In this case, you can use the ensemble's diversity and the accuracy of uh, each member. And the second one a strategy is the combination strategy. You, you must define how put working together each member. You can use, for example, trainable versus non-trainable combination strategies. Um, finally, this combination can be applied class levels versus class uh, specific continuous output, it depends on the problem. Uh, Human neural networks is an hybrid artificial neural network with three different modules. The first module is a, is a, a short introduction about this neural network is a 
uh, self-organizing map, which uh, the main uh, objective is uh, to obtain a topological map generation implementing a non-linear projection normally from n-dimensional space onto two-dimensional space using different uh, metric for distance. And the second module is the, the tolerance uh, layer. The main uh, objective of this module is to tune up the cohonent detectors. The idea is to fit in the detectors obtained by, by cohonent map and compare the input space with these different cohonent detectors. And the most important um, responsibility of this uh, layer is the uh, robustness given to the neural network against noise. And the, finally, the last module of this neural network is a dynamic neural network, is the labeling neural network. And this module is, um, has a dynamic dimension. In the first moment, there isn't any neurons, and the neurons appear and until they reach the final number of the cluster uh, present in the input space. And for obtaining this uh, uh, behavior, we use different biolo uh, biological mechanisms. One of them is the neurogenesis, Another one of them is the apoptosis, neural apoptosis. And finally, these processes are controlled by one kind of uh, synapses, is silent synapses. With this different uh, biological mechanisms, we can move between the number of uh, neurons in this uh, artificial neural network. And finally, we will use the supervised version of this architecture, the human uh, S neural network. The studies performed by us is M, the detection of uh, mild cognitive impairment, differential diagnosis of dementia, and the early detection of mild cognitive impairment. This is. Mm, uh, in, in this case, we are working with healthy people and early MSI and late uh, MSI CI. And we are using different kind of data set, passing from different medical records, different hospital, and the uh, public repository ADNI. Feature vectors, uh, clinical criteria plus risk factors, and essentially we are using neuropsychological um, scale, neuropsychological test, from cognitive function to instrumental one, and even for functional uh, aspect. The first study is to solve the differential diagnosis between different kinds of dementia using human S. This is the scheme for dementia diagnosis. The, in the consulting room, the uh, physician get the different clinical record. And with this uh, information, pre-processing and go through the human S uh, neural network until obtain what kind of pathology is presented by the patient. The data sets here are consultation of uh, Alzheimer's patients in the Alzheimer's Patient Association of Gran Canaria in Canary Island, Spain. And we use different kind of cognitive, functional, and instrumental neuropsychological tests. Specifically, we work with mini-mental, FAST, CAS, Bartel, and Lauter Brody uh, scales with different missing 
um, data and with different percentage of uh, uh, pathology. We will use a cross-validation method and we have noticed, noted that there exists a very high correlation between all different neuropsychological uh, scale or neuropsychological tests. Instead of to use the monolithic human AS architecture, we have used an ensemble of different human network working together and we have using the um, validation error and the diversity between pairs in order to select with what different modules uh, will be used for us, okay, with different input space. The diversity strategy used its correlation of error in pairs. And finally, this is the five members for building up our intelligent system. If you use the majority voting uh, strategies, single or weighted, you can obtain an accuracy close to the 90%, it's 88%, and it's a better result when we try to detect the mild cognitive impairment. When, when you are working with differential diagnosis, it's better probably to use other kind of uh, clinical criteria. If you compare the results obtained by uh, our ensemble and with the physicians, you can find some difference value between both, okay? This is the sensitivity and this is for the physician. The second study are working in the detection of mild cognitive impairments, okay? And the data set in this case are using the public data ADNI, okay? Using only group of AD and mild cognitive impairment patients. In the first, we developed two studies. The first one is only a detection of mild cognitive impairment it, from healthy control. And the second one is uh, no binary classification, is early, last, and cognitive people using different kind of scales. This is a hard problem. In this case, we use a counter-propagation network, and in this case, we use human S network. This is the different uh, information, uh, demographic data of the different patients. And finally, we obtain this intelligence system. In the first study, the artificial neural network is a counter-propagation neural network, okay? It's uh, paradigmatic, everybody knows. And this is, we have used a Roper feature selection method and obtained for our results in 95% for the uh, area under the rock cure and 86% for the accuracy and 90% for sensitivity. You can, see, you can see a very good rock cure and this value correspond with the sensitivity of our system and this with the neurologist geriatrician and primary care physician because it's very important to compare the, uh, the result of our technique with the diagnosis of physician. And you remember in our first trans uh, uh, slide, I tell you, I told you, please keep in mind that the best important things is use it in primary care stage because you can you can see that the sensitivity 
for the primary care stage is very, very low. And with system, we can obtain a very high system, a uh, very high result, and it's very, very, very simple. Um, in the second study, we, we use different kind of mild cognitive impairments. It's, mo it's harder than the previous one. And we use this architecture, and the results are worse than in the binary classification, but do you remember the result given by deep learning using neuroimaging and using a very, very hard artificial neural network close to the 56% in the accuracy? Here is only one monolithic neural network, only neuropsychological test, no neuroimaging necessary, because it's very important for, for primary care stage, because when appear the first symptomatology of the cognitive impairment, if you use neuroimaging, it's not easy to find different anatomical affections, and you can obtain a 60, uh, sorry, 57% in accuracy, and this is the AUC for different classes. It's, it's a good result, but we hope to obtain better than this <coughs> using a growing neural gas, okay, and working with hybrid system, and even our um, idea is using other kind of uh, uh, clinical criteria in primary care state, like human gait as a clinical biomarker, and very important things is moving on or working on towards obtain a biomarker for AD, w trying to obtain to reach a biological signature of Alzheimer's disease. As conclusion, we say that intelligent artificial neural network based tools and clinical application are very uh, interesting aspect and the computational intelligence is uh, a smart and flexible alternative for intelligent clinical decision system this clinical decision system using human based system to assist differential and early diagnosis is very important. These methods are easy, useful for primary care scopes. And there are our study, another important thing is to obtain a set of diagnosis criteria that is capable to detect mild cognitive impairment. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry for <laughs> that. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe have some questions. Okay, we have the one. Just give us a second. Is uh, possible some uh, any water? Any water is possible. Uh, very good work, uh, Professor Carmen. I'm very happy to see that uh, a very interesting research you're doing. Just two, three, you know, a very minor question. One is the data set. Like, did you, did you, did you benchmark the data set? That's one uh, question I have. Because if you are talking about data set, is your, your food, your bread and butter is actually the data set. So if you have a benchmark data set, and if that is, can be used by the community, then can we apply your data set for the global dementia cause and effect understanding? That's very important. Second question that I have is, is there any way you tried an approach to develop self-determination of self-determination through apps, mobile apps, uh -huh. uh, to determine the early stage of dementia, early stage dementia, determination through mobile apps, 
smartphone so that you know some people may be very smart they can determine that they are in the stage of dementia so that they can take some you know primitive measures to overcome that thank you so much okay um, concerning with the first question uh, yes uh, we have um, made some benchmark with um, not exactly with the first uh, data set when we made the differential diagnosis because this is we must to use the specific diagnosis criteria that the uh, hospital provide us but in the second study before to use the different data set we made we, we tried to obtain what are the best small set of diagnosis criteria in order to detect uh, mild cognitive impairment. Well, it's important to obtain, to use cognitive instrument and function, functional instrument. And in that moment, we can use the different uh, diagnosis criteria used uh, around the world, the more typical, the more standard, and used for another kind of people. Even when I put the slide with the table, the different clinical uh, data set use practically the same, the same neuropsychological um, test. Essentially one of them, minimental scale. But the minimental scale is very useful and is used for every people, but is in our study is not the best. It's very good, but it's not essentially the best. And the second one, the uh, physicians told us that for my cognitive environment was better to use instead of mini mental, for example, the Montreal uh, assessment is MOCA. It's it's okay, it's very good. And we've compared in a qualitative, qualitative aspect with different uh, other um, methods, for example, deep learning, neuroimaging, and even with the same criteria, and our results are comparable. And in the second one, in the second question, sorry, uh, we have developed one, uh, up for, but this is in progress. But this uh, uh, app is, uh, let, let me see. Our efforts are focused in the clinical uh, scope. It's not for the patient. Our system are developed for the doctors. It's not used for the patient. We have developed an e-health system in which you can put our intelligence system inside and the doctors in the consultation room can use it. When you work with app, can be used for the patients and can be used for the doctors. It depends on the level of the patient because we are speaking about dementia. It's not so easy. In the first stage can be used in the M cognitive environment, but when it's Alzheimer's disease, for example, the dementia is onset is not so easy. For the doctor, is in, for the caregivers can be used, and for the familiar people. And we have uh, developed some app in which the caregiver can um, report the different tests and send to the doctor, for example, or when the caregivers has uh, some problems with the patients and say, oh my God, can I do it now? Oh, I can send a report for my app to the doctor and the doctor can give me something. But it's in progression, it's not developed, I still, okay. Okay, I have a question. Thank you for your uh, talk. Actually, it is an interesting area in artificial intelligence. My concern or question, have you compared your results with the state-of-the-art research in this area? First, have you compared your results with state-of-the-art 
or previous work in this area? Uh, compare. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I, yeah, I compare, understand. Yes. Convert, no, yeah. compare. Yes, we have compared with uh, qualitative com uh, compare with different, of course, with different uh, researchers, with different in computational intelligence, all uh, work using artificial neural network, yeah. using deep learning, and the, these results are absolutely comparable. Okay, compared to people use deep learning in the same area, uh, how you classify your work compared uh, to, to this <laughs> method? <laughs> It's, it's subjective, but no, no, it's, uh, in, in an objective way, it, there are different aspects to consider. For example, um, the clinical criteria used by us are easier, are not invasive. For example, you can use this system in primary care stage, but if you work with deep learning, this is not possible. Why? No, you can use deep learning, but normally deep learning are method for image because it's, it's uh, robust. You, it's, not, it's not feature selection, it's, it's uh, raw data inside. And you can ask you, but when the first cognitive decline, the, the first cognitive loss appear, can you find this uh, loss in a neuron imaging? Probably not. And we have compared our results with in the same study, but using MRI neuroimaging with our method, and was worse. No, was better. Why? Because it's very complicated to detect anatomical affection differences between a in mild cognitive impairment. When you continue working in dementia, for example, AD, in this case, can be better. Okay, thank you. That thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. I would request our honorable uh, chair, Dr. Ethan Singson, to kindly step forward. Along with, I would also like to request Dr. Ajirana sir to step forward and Dr. Abhishek to please join us here and help us in felicitating the speaker. Dr. Archina, please help. So, thank you. I think uh, we had a very good discussion, this session, and also very nice presentation, very, even though related to the human life, that is more important. This study, once it's related to the really the human life, it is basically, we say it is extraordinary research. Also, all the three sessions were talking about here and there about the AI techniques, although the conference itself is on AI techniques, but you see the different directions. And I hope it was very fruitful discussions, and also, no doubt, in the half an hour, very difficult to grasp complete the subject. But the, you got the, some idea, some other things, that is basically the takeaway for you uh, to do the future research in those areas. So thank you for all the speakers and the chairs, although I was also chair and speaker. Thank you for myself. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, madam. Uh, we are just uh, taking a break of a uh, very small break of 10 minutes of tea break. Uh, I would also request all the people in the house to kindly share their names if they are interested in going to Burj Khalifa after the event today, after the conference today. So we have planned a small visit to Burj Khalifa and uh, organizers will be here. So you need to share your names with us. So we'll be having a visit there. Thank you so much. Uh, deep learning can be successful. But uh, you just told about like uh, it's more successful than images.
Hello? Can you hear me now? I'll keep kissing just in case I need the laser. No, no, I just need the laser in case oh, I. Yeah. We better start, sir, with your permission. Can we start? Yes, sure. Okay, thanks. That's wonderful. <laughs> Analysis and visualization for Exasail supercomputers and experimental facilities. We have with us. Dr. Piyush Maheshwari to chair the session. Dr. Piyush Maheshwari is a professor and dean in engineering technology and architecture at Amity University, Dubai. Before joining Amity, he has held various positions at various levels in multinational organizations like technical leader for R&D and innovation management at Ericsson, senior enterprise architect and technical leader at Pitney Bowes, industry solutions architect and senior researcher and at IBM, Chief Architect and Head Technology and Innovation Center at Dell Services. He has been the Chief Scientific Advisor at Vartec Australia. Dr. Maheshwari has completed his PhD from the University of Manchester. I would request Dr. Maheshwari to kindly help me in introducing our speaker for the session. Thank you so much, sir. Well, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Valerio Pascucci. Uh, Valerio is the inaugural John R. Parks Endowed Chair of the University of Utah and the founding director of the Center for Extreme Data Management Analysis and Visualization Group. Uh, Dr. Valerio is also a faculty of Scienti Scientific Computing and Image Institute. He's a and, and a professor of the School of Computing at University of Utah. And he's also a laboratory fellow of PNNL and a visiting professor in KAUST, which is in Saudi Arabia. Uh, before joining Utah, Dr. Valerio was the data analysis group leader of the Center of Applied Scientific Computing at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and an adjunct professor of computer science at the University of California, Davis. Valerio's research interests include big data management and analytics, progressive multi-resolution techniques in scientific visualization, discrete topology, geometric compression, computer graphics, computational geometry, uh, and solid modeling. Valerio is also the co-author co of more than 200 refereed journal and conference papers and is an associate editor of the IEEE Transactions of Visualization and Computer Graphics. So, Dr. Valerio. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, in this presentation, I would like to go through a few examples of uh, work that we've done in the last uh, uh, mostly 10 years at uh, the University of Utah uh, since I founded the center uh, focus on dealing with large data. And, um, and I'll make uh, uh, some comments where a lot of this work that kind of started uh, in the space of uh, traditional data analytics now is more and more in need of uh, techniques from machine learning uh, artificial intelligence space. Um, so <coughs> Uh, this is the center uh, 
that was established almost 10 years ago and has a number of people involved from uh, high performance computing, databases, machine learning, and uh, uh, application in that area, of course, in addition to uh, visualization, information visualization, scientific visualization, and uh, uh, involves a number of activity uh, in collaboration with uh, national laboratories, um, especially from the DOE national laboratory system, but also with the supercomputing centers like the one in KAUST uh, or the K computer in Japan. And, and that involves uh, typically uh, dealing with very large amount of data. Uh, practically, we try to look at uh, data analytics, uh, data management problems from the uh, somewhat uh, application uh, oblivious perspective in a way of that then it can be used in many different fields. So we have data that come from uh, large supercomputer facilities. Uh, we have data, so like from also the big machines that I was talking about before, we have data coming from uh, light sources, satellite imagery, B photography application. And certainly this, the simulation space also offer many interesting problems from uh, combustion to subsurface modeling, uh, various engineering application, material sciences, and so on. Um, uh, uh, one of the early example of work uh, dealing with uh, very large data sets that require fairly sophisticated data analysis technique was uh, this uh, type of Raleigh Taylor mixing. Uh, this is the type of mixing between layer of two fluids of different uh, uh, concentration, uh, different viscosity. And this is uh, the type of mixing that happens, uh, uh, for example, when there is a supernova explosion. Looks very similar also when you put milk in your coffee and so on. And people want to measure in detail uh, kind of the, these complex bubble structures and counting those uh, bubbles and so on. And that gives some insight of the physics of the phenomenon. Now, practically, this also means you have to go through uh, very quickly through tens of terabytes of data and then do the analytics, adjust parameter, do it again, and so on. And that is done in close collaboration with the scientists. Uh, in the early uh, stages, actually, this was done more carefully, uh, tuning manually uh, topological definitions. And now, as things scale more and more, we're trying to transition to out using the, this type of manual uh, analysis uh, supported by uh, various data analytics and make it into not just the tools to find some solution, but the uh, tools to f build the learning sets for future algorithms that can be automated more and more. Uh, this is another example that gives a sense of the application space. Uh, uh, the dots you, you can see here in the screen, those are actual satellite location. Uh, and this is an example where we were looking at identify this satellite that was actually uh, shot down by the um, uh, Chinese government was one of their own satellites. And, uh, and in the US, they were trying to track the debris uh, through a set of simulation and see in real time what other pieces would be affected by that if there is a, a, a possibility of impact with something else and so on. And so, but in terms of structure, this would be a series of simulation, simulations, streaming the data while the simulation is running, visualize and analyze the results, and then try it again, tuning parameters and developing uh, multiple scenario. And in a way, this idea of uh, developing, analyzing, understanding multiple scenarios is fairly typical, actually, the scientific discovery process where you want to start tuning um, conditions and try to understand how they affect uh, the outcome. So in terms of the way we organize uh, overall the work, we have different aspects uh, that we focus on. Uh, obviously, performance is a big one, so how to move the data quickly, how to use parallel machines to get the results, and so on. Uh, how to compute things in C2 versus post-processing. But then, uh, kind of as an orthogonal dimension, you want to look at different uh, data analytics techniques that can uh, uh, determine whether you extract uh, the right features or not, and, but then you want to do it fast enough that then the users can come back and, 
uh, validate that you're doing the right thing. So we focus a lot on topology, statistics, and now re recently uh, machine learning is becoming much more of an aspect that we're focusing on. And that actually now we're finding a way to layer that on top of previous analytics so that we combine the power of data reduction with still the ability of having uh, predictive power in that sense. Uh, now user access, usability also are a very important aspect of the process. We build tools that scientists have to use every day. And so we don't just stop at the definition of new technique and new algorithm. We, we actually look at building an actual software tool that get used and deployed. And, and in doing that, we focus on specific application space. It can be a design of a new fuel for clean combustion. It can be a design of a smart city services, uh, climate, we have worked a lot on climate modeling. Uh, as you can imagine now, in terms of funding scenario in the US, that's not as supported as it used to be. But in terms of the familiar techniques developed, uh, all those kind of come together. Uh, for moving data fast, processing it fast, and so on, uh, we have been working on uh, a, at least some kind of a few layers where we look at how you organize and store the data. And a big success story has been uh, storing big arrays of data using space filling curves, which in modern machines tend to make uh, things very fast in a very cheap way because cache usage is one of the key aspects that can make or break performance. And this allows you to um, optimize the cache use without knowing what is the cache size and changing the hardware and so on. A lot of uh, data streaming, progressive computation using out of core techniques so that you can uh, process very effectively data that is much larger than your main memory, that is maybe not located in the location where you want to look at the results and so on. And, and but that requires to make a, an effective use of approximated solutions versus waiting for full exact representation. And then there is the practical aspect uh, that's kind of more of a system side of the research where we look at practical scaling. It's, it's anybody involved in high performance computing knows that even if you write an algorithm that it looks in theory is going to scale, uh, when you, every time you go to the next order of magnitude, you end up facing different bottlenecks, different challenges. So uh, I'll show later we have some components, for example, go from an iPhone all the way to three quarter of a million cores on very highly parallel machines. And that level of scaling, uh, it's very unusual uh, to be reached in a single piece of uh, software. Um, I'll focus here in terms of the various data analytics uh, on techniques that we worked on on the topology uh, space. And this is actually the area where we, are, we had a lot of success in various fields and this kind of just uh, a short vignette of the different area that we work on from material science to neuroscience, cosmology, and, and so on. And, and this is actually the area that not only had a lot of success, but is becoming the source for a lot of new work uh, in combining uh, reduced representation with machine learning. Uh, that's ongoing work, where, so I'm, I'm more kind of looking for people try and uh, strike people imagination and maybe build uh, collaborations in that space. But the short of it is that so topology re re creates very compact representation that do not lose most of the quality of the information and therefore it's a very good target for data reduction while still you have open-ended analytics. Uh, just to give you an idea, so this is a case where we have been uh, studying uh, the structure of this porous material. Uh, this is the failure under the impact with a micrometeoroid. Uh, this is a type of material that they put, uh, for example, in, in the National Ignition Facility. It's a big experiment where they're trying to do a little more fusion using lasers instead of the Tomovac approach. Uh, and also they have some similar material that is super light and they put like in space missions and so on. L l studying the robustness of this material is very important because being porous is lighter and then the question is does it retain the robustness. 
that you need. So to study this, we built, we basically take data from the simulation and then we build these topology graphs that effectively retain all the space of information that you have from the original molecular dynamics simulation, but is reduced by two, three orders of magnitude easily. And still, uh, you see, you can explore, look at what different solution you can build. Uh, and then you can use the graph to study the strength, the reliability of the material. And in fact, you can do things that, like uh, uh, building the shape of this cavity that from the raw data, so the surface like this one you see in the picture, that from the topology can be built fairly naturally and from just the raw uh, pixel or voxel from the simulation is very hard to build. Uh, another example uh, where we use uh, exactly the same family of techniques uh, is uh, for molecular dynamics. Uh, typically atoms, when you look at the potential or some of the other functions that you're built, uh, correspond to maxima, minima, or subtle points for bonds in, in the distribution. And, and so topology is great because without knowing anything about the simulation, it actually reconstructs the location of the atoms, can show you if there is a problem in the simulation. In particular here, we're designing a material for a battery. And this network, uh, when those uh, connected components have like six sides, like an hexagon, um, then it means that holds charge very effectively. When you start having seven, eight sides and some more, then it's a defect in the material that can be expressed very well. And that can, should be found uh, now in this representation, it's easy to find it automatically and then help uh, the scientists to design better and better material all the time. Uh, this is a case of a combustion simulation. Uh, so those are the topological features that we find <coughs> in the simulation. So what's, what they call the extinction and uh, reignition uh, for the intermediate combustion phenomena. And, and those are the regions uh, that are related to those events that are needed for scientists to um, uh, design better way of, of mixing the fuels and starting the combustion. Um, this is actually was a very interesting result because the shape of those regions uh, followed the definition in topology terms that the scientists needed, but it was very surprising in terms of results because the they were expecting kind of much more flat pancake-like shapes and those look very differently and this helped the scientists kind of rethink carefully what was their mental picture we were building about the data and then uh, try and design the next stage uh, in more effectively. Uh, one thing that actually was very uh, satisfying, this is the type of results that they were looking, use that practically in the work, this is the typical uh, volume rendering for visualizing the data, different uh, part of the fluid. This is really the corresponding topology graph that one has to work on. And, uh, and this is where a lot of the science happened. And, uh, and this is where actually we're looking at building larger and larger those graphs. For a few small examples, we can manually go in and try and find the results. And then later on, we want to uh, use uh, an automated or semi-automated approach using artificial intelligence and uh, extract the features in an automated way. Uh, one good thing is that this is actually the same data. Uh, we did uh, present this at the uh, Citadel of Science in Paris. And this is kind of a, an exhibit of fire. And they're using our visualization from those real simulation to present this to the general public. And to some degree, this is one also aspect that we strive a lot. We would like to push a lot of the science results and, and present it to the general public and kind of show the impact uh, of the work we're doing. Uh, in terms of the uh, scaling aspect, uh, one uh, uh, component that I was mentioning before is that kind of the extreme range of scalability that we use for our software. And so um, the core data movement uh, layer that we're using uh, for accessing the data, streaming it in real time, or use the uh, file system of large supercomputer 
use a library uh, it's called Visus. Uh, you can find it at visus.org. And the scaling ranges goes all the way to uh, small handheld devices, all the way to large machines like Mira at Argon National Lab, and that's uh, three quarter of a, a million cores, uh, all run effectively. And in fact, uh, in terms of IO library, that's the only one that reached the 80% of the nominal performance, which for HPC system is extremely hard to achieve. Very often people end up with like 10%, it's already a big deal. And so how we use it? Uh, well, we start building a solution like this one. Uh, that is a very large uh, data collection uh, store in NASA. Uh, it's called one of those uh, nature runs. It's 3.5 petabytes of data, uh, pretty big. And uh, the question is, it's there, it's normally open, but practically because it's so big, nobody gets to see anything. I mean, they have a bunch of pre-computed picture and, uh, and nothing else. So uh, in collaboration with NASA and Lawrence Livermore National Lab, uh, we actually created a, an experimental uh, web service where Livermore has uh, about 100 terabytes of uh, cache uh, I know 100 terabytes seems a lot, but compared to 3.5 petabyte, uh, it's a small piece of cache where part of the data gets migrated on demand. And then we have uh, data streaming services that are allowed to access the data in real time, and so people can do uh, live exploration, for example, compute ensembles, change the parameter, remove um, uh, outliers, and so on. And when needed, that can one can always push the data into a large HPC machine uh, to do more detailed analytics or kind of more switch from the interactive to a batch mode uh, processing capability. Uh, this is a use case uh, focus on uh, acquisition of high value data. And I have uh, a couple of examples. This is from a light source, another from neuroscience. Uh, so <coughs> here they have to do those uh, uh, what they call shots where they acquire very high resolution data uh, from a, a, a light source, one of those synchrotron facilities. This is uh, near Argonne National Lab. And, uh, but the scientists doing it in this case were located at the University of Utah and uh, they needed to kind of monitor the acquisition in real time because as you can imagine renting those facilities is very expensive and you don't want to uh, fall in the traditional approach. You acquire data for several days, you go back home and you hope you didn't screw up, right? The, but that happens sometime and then the next, your next opportunity might be nine months before you are, have access again to the facility. So here we set up a, a Visual server on the source as data was acquired it was streamed live, and so the PI of the project from Utah, unfortunately she couldn't go there, uh, was able to monitor the acquisition uh, continuously, and so for those three days, every time they do the next shot, they had the, the data analyzed for the previous one, and made sure, and so this kind of what you will see in Utah when the data it was acquired in, uh, in Argon from that. Uh, acquisition. Here is a similar case where we're acquiring uh, data from a primate uh, brain. Uh, this is from a two photo microscope. Uh, we're hopefully switching soon uh, to light sheet microscopes. Uh, also visualized on a larger screen. And this is kind of what you uh, would see basically from home. You see the kind of the volume being scanned and acquired in real time. And again, you can also, you can imagine, you can expect, you can put triggers. There is a number of things you can do immediately. Uh, and if your microscope goes off calibration, you don't run the risk of losing a lot of information uh, just because you don't see that on the fly. Uh, here, it's a similar application, uh, but for geospatial data, uh, here it's uh, outcrop information uh, for a oil and gas application, and this will, it's a subsurface uh, data set uh, from an industry partner uh, where, again, they have this, those are very large volumes that normally would require 
many very large scale workstation and here they can do in real time on a laptop machine or something like that. Uh, we scale also in terms of output. Uh, uh, those are uh, kind of one of our power displays kind of out of commodity hardware and something like this can be really installed in now in a matter of uh, an hour or so. And this is the much more expensive uh, power wall display that we got installed uh, uh, at Kaust. Uh, they have very thin bezels and so on. But you see that uh, basically you get the scaling to use them, the resources you need uh, very well and very effectively. Is that for five minutes? OK. I'll speed, uh, speed up. So um, in terms of scaling of the results, uh, the real numbers, so this is on a variety of different uh, uh, HPC machines. Um, the reason why I report multiple ones is that they have different network and hardware infrastructure, so scaling actually is far from being a given. And uh, for example, on the supercomputing floor, we were showing in real time uh, results that were computed um, from that was from Argon National Lab. This is the scaling of our IO library. This is the on Mira. This is kind of the top competitors of technology about behind HDF5 or uh, PNSDF and things like that. And so, really, on the high end of the spectrum, we take a huge advantage. On top of the fact that the data is organized in a way that you can analyze it quickly, uh, even for the uh, Computation algorithm, some of the topology work. Uh, here we have the ability to run it in parallel, build sparse uh, distributed representation, and have very, very good scaling. Also with the flexibility of choosing how many core per node you would use, depending on how much you want to uh, use the nodes for doing multiple analytics at the same time. And so this is the practical case where, going back to the neuroscience, uh, where uh, acquiring all these large data sets and then to put them together you have to compute overlaps and so on. This gets really, really large and on an HPC machine uh, also using a high level description of the algorithm we can quickly get thousands of cores to run very efficiently uh, without requiring scientists to become expert in the field. So similar to the other use case here we build the infrastructure where you have the data acquisition facility, this become very easy to be as a shared resources. You can monitor in real time results and then as needed, you can connect to the large HPC resource and deal with larger and larger data sets. And now as a closing point, uh, we also look at uh, similar techniques to analyze high dimensional data sets. This is very important also to understand uh, ensemble simulations and so on. Uh, this is the uh, representation, for example, of uh, a climate modeling family of simulation. So here we are 21 dimensions. And using topology, instead of having kind of this clutter set of points that you project to high dimension, you can still see the structure, even though this is a terrain in 20 dimension. You can see what, which one are the valley, the peaks, and how they're connected to each other. And so here, for example, it's a combustion simulation. Uh, the three valleys correspond to poor combustion conditions, and this is the condition of uh, high quality burning. Uh, in this case, we have 10 chemical species, so 10 dimensional space. And uh, so, two of those valleys are well understood. Uh, you have fewer an oxidizer, or vice versa. This is actually a very interesting case where scientists are studying conditions where the burning is not efficient. But now because of poor uh, fuel uh, oxidizer ratio is that actually looks like the exhaust is putting out the flames, but then they restart and so on. Uh, those are similar application for nuclear engineering. Uh, high, high temperature here is really in bad news. You don't want to melt down in a reactor. And here we develop use cases where things uh, can be reduced to understanding a simple uh, particular valve in the analysis of the result. Now, since I'm running out of time, I'm skipping a few things. Just a final uh, comment on uh, taking a lot of this type of technology 
and uh, uh, looking at commercial applications. And so here is the data distribution used for medical application and uh, oil and gas application. They both need to annotate data and making uh, dealing with very large data sets. And also to have distributed installation of data sources like telemedicine in rural condition and things like that are very uh, needed in many, many areas. And with this type of flexible environment, you, you can make it work really well. Argentina, it's a partner we're working with. A lot of rural medicine needed. We're using our server here now. We're installing one out of a, a hospital in New Can, and this is one of our collaborators at the University of Utah. And the, and the last application is actually in the agricultural space. We had technology started from stitching images more for building panoramas, and now uh, we are working on the deployment for flying drone and stitching images in real time uh, on the field. Alternative techniques were required to use large cloud-based solution. And, and of course, now you build these massive images and you have to do the analytics to determine uh, pests, uh, needs for water, uh, weeds, various type of stress, and so on. And of course, you can imagine the need for uh, uh, AI and machine learning for uh, mining those images. And, and those are my closing comments. Uh, out of many of those techniques, there's huge opportunities and and challenge in terms of uh, creating training set is very hard and uh, because they typically involve humans. And so here we're developing a hybrid protocol where classical analytics can be used to build training set for those uh, applications. We need to learn to explore uh, the high dimensional spaces where these problems are defined and in fact explore those deep network themselves. And I thank you for your attention. Out of time. <laughs> Any quick questions? Do we need to throw? Or maybe not. We're out of time. <laughs> Someone has any uh, quick question? Uh, otherwise, yeah, Dr. Uh, uh, Valerio is with us. Uh, you can, you know, uh, mingle with him and ask more personal questions about the, his research. So, uh, so we already have got Dr. Piyush over here. I request Dr. Ajana sir to kindly come forward. And help me to acknowledge the work done by Professor Valerio. <laughs> Dr. Dilip Sharma sir as well. Please. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Here. Dr. Piyush and uh, Dr. Dilip. Sir. Sir. Ah, thank you. That's for you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. For you. This is for you. This is for also you. for me. Both are for you. <laughs> And it kind of is part of I was talking about interactive updated results actually. So that's like yeah. an aspect of that that we're not like about the because we want to visualize continuously things as, as they get updated. Uh, like in dynamically, if you're adding data, like if you are you know, accepting the data and analyzing it, what is the accuracy of the data? Like you are, yeah, yeah, somebody is saying something. Catch
So in the meantime, installation is being carried out. I would like to invite our chair for the next session, Dr. J.R.D. from University of Arkansas from USA. The topic of discussion is user experience for social human robot interactions. I would request Dr. Ajahn to kindly read the profile of Dr. G. Dr. J.R.D. received B.S. and M.S. degrees from Tsinghua University, China in 1997 and 2000 respectively. He completed his PhD in electrical engineering at the University of Central Florida in 2004. He joined the computer science and engineering department of the University of Arkansas as an assistant professor in fall 2004, where he is now a professor and, and 21st century research leadership chair. His research area is asynchronous integrated circuit design and hardware security. His trustable logic circuit design lab has been sponsored by various federal agencies and industry for over $8 million in the past 14 years. Dr. D has published one book and over 100 papers on technical journals and conferences. To his credit, he has five U.S. patents. Dr. D is a senior member of IEEE and an elected member of the National Academy of Inventors. So we would like to invite you to chair this session. Welcome you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Daryl Van Grunen, uh, who is a professor of information technology and the director of the Center for Community Technologies at the Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. She holds a PhD in computer science and became an honorary professor at Amity University, India, last year in 2018. She serves on a number of boards related to the fields of information communication technology, both nationally and internationally. Her area of, of expertise include, but is not limited to, using innovative technologies utilizing the fourth industrial revolution as an opportunity to address societal challenges related to education, healthcare, and the social innovation and entrepreneurship. To this end, she is also a principal investigator on a number of international research projects that aim to use innovations to address these societal challenges. Please welcome Dr. Van Grunen. Thank Good afternoon, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. alaykum. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. I think we have two microphones going. Maybe that's better. Can you hear me still clearly? So I'm going from the hardcore computer science to completely the opposite side of things, and that is the softer issues. Um, as was said in the introduction, one of my areas that I focus on is user experience. And um, of course, we all know that whatever we develop, be it a robot, be it a computer, be it whatever, if the user cannot use it, it does not work. So therefore, user experience becomes a critical element of what we do. So in this paper, I looked at the role and relevance of user experience of socially interactive robots. And then also, how do we consider that in the developing country context where socially interactive robots are viewed with resistance and apprehension? And I say that with great respect because on the African continent it is not something that we have come across frequently yet. Last night, I went to the Mall of Dubai, or the Dubai Mall, and I saw this wonderful exhibition of the Star Wars figurines and the robots and everything else. And I thought I can just imagine if this was somewhere on the African continent, how people would be interested and fascinated by that. And of course, 
most of all the young children who are needing to take up the science and the maths and the technologies. But something happened last year that sparked a bit of interest, um, and that is the movie Black Panther, and some of you may have seen that movie. And of course it's now up for, I think it's five or six Oscar nominations. But what made this so special is because of the lead characters being African, first and foremost. But second to that was taking artificial intelligence, virtual reality, right into the heart of Africa. One of the main characters, the lead characters in this movie, Dr. John Carney, is an honorary doctorate recipient from our university. Um, he lives in Port Elizabeth. Now, when he walks in the streets there, the children look at him and say, look at, there's Wakandla. You know, there's the, the artificial intelligence from there. So, suddenly it has brought something onto the radar of the developing countries as well. And up until now, uh, fourth industrial revolution and artificial intelligence, all of those have been sort of something out there in the far distance that we are not necessarily concerned with. So just for those of you who think, okay, this woman is in totally insane, what is this human-robot interaction that she's on about? Of course, whenever we interact with artificial intelligence, we do not think about it, that we are actually having to interact with something that is defined by communication protocols and all sorts of technology terms and not just something that happens here on the side. So those of you in the room who are old enough to remember Star Trek, that was many, many years ago, in those days we looked at it and we thought, oh my word, this is seriously futuristic. And now? We're way beyond Star Trek already. So, how do we interact with these kinds of technologies? So, I say there that communication between a human and a robot may take several forms, but these forms are influenced by whether the people and the technology are in close proximity. Now, I make the statement that we need to build in some emotion into these robots and artificial intelligent agents, the bots that we interact with. Um, last week I had a very frustrating week whereby one of my file servers that is hosted in the cloud went down and it's uh, hosting a number of medical systems, so you can imagine that's not too good. Um, and all I had to interact with was a bot. Now the bot sits who knows where, and I'm talking to this thing where I got to the stage that I said to my colleagues, you know, I need to talk to a human now because I need to explain my emotions to a human. I cannot talk to a robot or a bot at this point in time any longer. They do not understand my frustration. They do not sense my frustration and less so even when I'm typing a text to them. So how do we bring that, that robots and bots can respond to the emotions of human beings. So I want to show you just a short clip here. If you're okay chatting to Siri or Alexa, meet Furhat, putting an expressive face to the voice assistant. Hello world. It's developers promising we'll not only warm to Furhat, and I'm a social robot, we're going to trust it because it's not a person, it's a robot, and doesn't judge. I mean, we've seen uh, research that shows that people are, in certain situations, more comfortable opening up and talking about difficult issues with a robot compared to a human. Uh, because you meet a robot, it, people don't perhaps see that the robot has judgment or prejudice or pre perceived kind of notions about uh, them. So you're more comfortable opening up to it compared to talking to a, a human. Please tell me your flight number. JJ8071. This is Furhat at Frankfurt Airport, acting as a multilingual help desk. But it can do more. How about interviewing prospective staff without bias or discrimination, or even questioning patients in a clinic? 
the robot can change its age or gender or personality depending on the application. So in a way, we're opening up a new world. Of kind of every robot needs a different personality depending on the job it's going to do. I can change my face completely to match what I am supposed to do, like this. Okay, can you sound a bit more female then? Yes, of course. I feel much better when my voice matches my face. Tapping into the latest developments from gaming, the back projection system allows quick changes of face or personality, mirroring those interacting with it. I can't wait to see what other amazing uses will be built for me. It's all up to your imagination. So, there's an example of facial expressions and some emotions coming into these robots. But my question to you is, would you trust talking to a robot? I would not. To me, there's no emotion whatsoever. So they're talking about having robots in clinics, questioning patients about their health care. My first thought, of course, as a computer scientist would be, okay, where's this data going? Um, what are they doing with the data, etc.? So we, we need to be very careful and not necessarily think that artificial intelligence is the silver bullet to the future. And that's why the whole notion of user experience is so important. So if we look at the role of social um, interactive robots at the moment as it stands, they play an essential role in extending some uh, services, etc., that people perceive in life as necessary, and they can assist with some additional tasks and so forth. There's research on how they help the aged population, how they work with children with autism. In fact, in Cyprus last year, at the Cyprus University of Technology, I saw how they are using robots um, for accessibility to teach people sign language. So they have robots without a mouth, and they're teaching you sign language so that you cannot lip read. Now, that, I think, has a place in the society when it's being used in that particular fashion. But maybe we need to, to think carefully about how we bring robots and artificial intelligence into our lives. Um, I think what is important is that rather than just getting them to mechanically perform tasks, let them respond intelligently to certain things. There's a role for in traffic regulations, um, things like that. I'm not sure that I would necessarily want to sit and listen to the humor and the jokes of a robot, you know, during an entertainment session of some s sorts. I would prefer to interact with a real person. Of course, if we then move to the user experience side of things, now, this is a, a new area that's being researched, uh, the user experience of then the human interaction with robotics and, and robots. But what is important is that there is a very, very key role to be played in terms of user experience. When I interact with these technologies, how will I experience that? Is it something that will instill trust with me? Um, do I foresee that I will continue to interact with robots? And specifically as we're moving into the future, to have a look at that and see what is it that we need to do. So if we look at it from a design perspective, I think it's important that if we start developing artificial intelligence, that we need to look at what it is that the human would want to experience when interacting with this machine, this robot, this whatever. Um, I just in, earlier on did a walk around outside and I was talking to some of the children who were relaying their experiences in their school with wellness and, and all of that. And you know, there's a lot to be said for the passion that you have when you tell the story. So how do you translate that to an artificial body that is just there? Of course, then what is important is to define the problem that the robot is trying to solve. We're not just having robots for the sake of robots. It must be there to serve a real purpose. Otherwise, there's no point in having it. Um, and then, of course, prototype these and test it with real users. 
Now, some of you may have heard of Alexa. If you, you, you know Alexa. Okay, so I'm often wondering that when they designed Alexa, how much user testing did they do? Because when you watch the following, you will understand what I'm saying. I assume all of you know what Alexa is, right? So Toyota just announced that they're adding Alexa to their cars so you can control things with your voice. It's supposed to be convenient and helpful. Here's their commercial. Starting this year, Toyota and Lexus luxury models will come with Amazon Alexa. Alexa, turn on the AC. Turning on AC. Finally, a virtual assistant to help you navigate. Alexa, where's the nearest gas station? Nearest gas station in 1.5 miles. And to help maintain your vehicle. Alexa, order more brake pads. Ordering new brake pads, although maybe if you didn't stop so close to the car in front of you. I left plenty of room. You drive too aggressively. If you were just quiet for two seconds, two seconds. She'll talk to you literally the entire time you're driving. I think you should have turned back there. I know where I'm going! <laughs> Hi. You know why I pulled you over? No, officer. I am. Because we were driving 72 miles per hour in a 35 mile per hour zone. Anything else I should know? Two miles back, we rolled through a stop sign without coming to a complete stop. Also, there are illegal fireworks in the trunk. Sir, I'm going to need you to step out of the car, please. Amazon Alexa. You'll never get away from OK. So you see what I mean about user experience? I looked at this video and I thought there's no way ever in my life that I would have an Alexa because if that's the way that she responds to whatever, um, you know, there's also a limit to what artificial intelligence should be allowed to do. And in my opinion, that's taking it a little bit too far. But on a more serious note, if we look at the applications of social robots, um, there are many conversational agents that are being used in the field of education. And I think particularly in the, the areas of maths and science, there's a very big need for that. And there it can play an important role. Um, we're needing to understand mathematical solutions. Maybe that's perfectly OK to interact with a bot of some sorts and let the bot explain to you how to go through the mathematical equation. But maybe if I'm talking about my mental wellness or my personal wellness, I may not be so keen to talk to just a robot as such. Um, of course, children diagnosed with autism, they respond extremely well to robots and interacting with robots. Um, and there's a lot of ongoing research in that space. But then also something interesting that I've come across is that um, often in court cases nowadays, when there's an in-camera um, session by a witness or, or even a child, child abuse or rape cases, they now use robots to interview the victim. And there again, that is quite an interesting uh, phenomena that is, is occurring now. Because that means that the person is not so traumatized by having to face the whole court circumstances and the environment and everything else. They're far more focused on reliving the experience and sharing that experience. Um, and th there's a lot of studies happening around that. And I think that, that makes for interesting research. But that's probably still a little bit for the future as well. Um, and then there are the social caretakers where you help the, the aged, where they are lonely and they need company. Um, and sometimes when people have dementia, etc., we heard someone earlier on speaking about dementia, that they do not necessarily relate to a particular human being anymore because there's just this vacuum that comes and goes in their minds. So in an instance like that, there is probably a role for robot companions that can interact with the elderly um, and just keep them company whilst they are going through their days. And then, of course, there's also some toys that can be used uh, for children, but to teach them many different things, not just a toy to walk around. Um, again, outside in the exhibition area, there's some interesting little robots that they built that's playing golf. Um, with the Raspberry Pi in that. Now, I think that is 
that is the way to go. I would much rather do that than just give a child a robot or a drone or something. Let them build something meaningful with that and use it for educational purposes. So I want to come to robots and artificial intelligence in Africa. Now, of course, we've done many things in Africa that has not been done in the rest of the world and vice versa. One of it you would know is what we do with mobile phones um, supersedes what is being done by the rest of the world. So in Africa, there's a notion that the fourth industrial revolution and artificial intelligence, etc., will cause people to lose their jobs. Um, I saw a video last week from The Economist on exactly that, where they were going on for about an hour and 20 minutes about ro how robots will take over people's jobs and so forth. And I disagree with that. Um, at the end of the day, there's still some human needed somewhere along the line to get this robot to do what it, you want it to do, first and foremost, and also to interact with setting it up and, and doing things like that. So I want to say that um, in Africa we should steer away from the threat of artificial intelligence, but rather look at how can we use this to increase the productivity of the country? How do we increase the GDP of the country? So we've been stagnant in our capacity and um, I think artificial intelligence is well poised to make a change to that. Uh, capital is scarce, but there are lots and lots of ideas. And maybe we should look at how do we process automation that can enable businesses to run on leaner models rather than just dismissing artificial intelligence altogether. And then, of course, there's one other very important element that comes with that, and that is Machines can empower low-skilled workers to actually perform more responsible tasks because you now have a machine that you get to do certain aspects of the task and then your workers can do something that is more responsible. So we create a sense of empowerment through that. Um, and of course, we in developing countries have a very big need for skills training and education and again this is where technology can come in and make a bit of a difference there. Not just deploying, I mean I would hate to see in a lecture hall a robot standing here teaching students. I think that would be completely unacceptable because it takes away that human interaction, human element, but there are certain other ways in which you can do that. So I want to come to the end before I get the bell and um, there goes my own. So I want to say that I think for social robots to provide long-term added value to people's lives, it is of major importance that we consider a positive user experience. How do we interact with these robots? And then of course there's the, the human-centered view that emphasizes various aspects including acceptance, usability, credibility, trust, all of that becomes a huge big, big issue that emerges when you are dealing with humans and robots talking to one another. Um, something that really troubles me, and, and it's been troubling me for many years, and it will probably continue to trouble me for many years, is that user experience and usability are two such critical elements to any piece of technology, yet it's always tagged on right at the end because there's not enough time, there's not budget, all of those things. And what happens in the end? People are having to pay so much more for training and redeveloping artifacts because they did not do usability testing or user experience observations. So if you are part of the fraternity that is developing all these artificial intelligent agents, please make sure that you first check with those who will be interacting with them that they are happy with the user experience that they are experiencing when interacting. And again, I say what I started with, remember, if the user cannot use it, 
it does not work. And with that, I say thank you for listening. And if you're interested in what we do in the Center for Community Technologies, you're welcome to go and follow us on Twitter or visit our Facebook page. Thank you very much. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, there is a number of this is, I say, psychological obstacles in interacting and developing this positive user experience. But how do you see in future, let's say in 30 years, uh, with this new generation of tech-savvy children that are growing up uh, with technology, do you think that this will still be the case or we, we might have the society where uh, we will trust more in technology than we trust, trust each other? That's a very interesting question. And I think as we go through the next few generations, where we get to the fifth and the sixth industrial revolution, it will become so part and parcel of your life that um, I think there will be automatic trust. If I look at the younger generation now, you, you look at young children, they are barely a year old and they can use a mobile device already. You hand it to them and they mimic what they see the adults doing. So they literally grow up with the device in their hands and they trust it implicitly. Um, also the younger generation have this notion of sharing information on social platforms everywhere, trusting. Um, people often ask me, would you put this out in, on the web? My answer to them always is, if you don't want it out there, don't put it out there, because it's never going to disappear. And that is because I don't trust, and, and I'm from generations where we don't trust technology. But I do believe, I think you are right, that in 20, 30 years from now, the picture will look very differently. Just as we would probably trust technology, we will not be eating food like we do anymore. We will more than likely just have a capsule implanted or something like that. So I think the possibilities are endless, yes. It would be interesting to know what it looks like then, but we will probably not be around. <laughs> uh, it was really a very, very interesting thing. In fact, uh, we at India are almost, you know, going through the similar things right now. Uh, uh, the, the company through which we have booked our package for Dubai, you know, they had this uh, robot answering to my initial queries, and it was a substandard robot, and it used to act very foolishly. For example, if I typed uh, just any random letter, X, Y, Z, it would answer me a few things. Okay, what is your journey, and all that. It would respond like that. So these are some of the challenges which are there in the developing countries right now. However, having said that, Recently, there was a news in uh, Japan, you know, they fired uh, some 30 odd employees and these employees were robots actually. And uh, these robots, they were fired because they were not answering or responding to the customers <laughs> properly in the <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> and also, we have some uh, recent uh, evidence, you know, for, uh, largely from US, uh, where they have uh, large supply chain houses, uh, where they have replaced uh, thousands of workers because they have automated the entire system with AI applications. So uh, your argument that, uh, you know, ultimately at the end of that it is humans who is going to actually handle this. But don't you think, you know, people ultimately going to lose uh, jobs and then there will always be a divide between those who knew technology and those who did not know? Yeah. I think, and, and as much as I say that um, people will not lose jobs. Where the part of South Africa where I am in Port Elizabeth on the coast is an industrial city and it is the motor manufacturing hub of the country. So in the manufacturing um, factories of VW, Mercedes-Benz, all of those, they have robots assembling the vehicles. But there's still the things where the customer interface, for example, as you just recited now that you know the robots were fired because they didn't give the right answers to the customers. 
those things you would still have to need some human intervention unless we can really truly train artificial intelligent agents to perfection which is probably I mean we don't even get it right with humans how do we think we're going to manage it there because it, it will be subjective I do think that there, there will be some element of job loss but not as major as what people anticipate it to be and if people are trained to use the technology in a different manner that will enhance their productivity I can think of using technology when you're going out into agriculture and things like that as opposed to just saying okay um, we now have a robot that's going to work the land or harvest the crops you know so help people to use the technology to their benefit and not just to see it as a threat and, and that's it hello ma'am even i have a question like you have given one application for virtual education like to children right but i think that will handicap the ch mind of the children like if you are using for every problem a robot you're not applying your own mind you're not uh, doing your science you know we can have this kind of a technology when we are having specially enabled children or you know differently enabled children but uh, i don't think so it should be used for normal education purpose also what do you what's your take on that yeah and i i totally agree with you because i think we are already through mobile technology and tablets and computers and so on children are not being taught to think they do not have lateral thinking processes anymore um, I'm horrified sometimes at students when I will ask them a simple mathematical calculation wait wait let me just get my calculator <laughs> what, what do you mean you need to calculate it? And many students they simply do Google yes or they Google so you know um, I totally agree with that I think if it is used to supplement face-to-face -face interaction yes but not to take over and replace um, and if you use it in a manner whereby you can engage that child that may not want to stand up and ask a question and so forth yes then we use it but not to replace the entire education system yeah, uh, because I think social interaction will be limited for yeah. kids and it, it's not that healthy for yeah. their own so social well-being yes. and then they become it's uh, completely a misfit in society and they don't know Artifi how to uh, it will be totally an artificial society <laughs> <laughs> exactly an artificial society, society yes yeah that's right thank you Um, you spoke of employment and unemployment robots taking over jobs, but uh, don't you think that opens up uh, a lot of risk to wherever they are being employed? I mean, a human can be trusted more than a robot. You know, you can appeal to the nature of the human, and but you can't do that to a robot. A robot simply does what it's told to do. So, what's your take on that? So that's why I say that I do not believe people will become completely obsolete in the process because of that very risk that the robot can only do what you tell it to do so somewhere in the background along the lines there still needs to be a human body that tells this robot do this do that protect things in this or that manner and until we have solved the cyber security issues of the world and yes I know the cyber security experts in the room will probably have my head for this but there are still so many breaches and so many gaps in that um, we cannot completely rely on artificial intelligence until we have resolved those issues so totally I agree there must still be some form of human, inter human intervention at the back end and only if we know it is 100% secure will people start trusting I mean if I were to ask you how many of you would go online and just buy a car online you'll say to me you're insane I mean, why would I go and buy a car online? I want to get into the car, drive the thing, etc. Um, would you trust a robot to buy a car on your behalf? I mean, I wouldn't. Um, especially not if it's a Google car. Um, you know, those driverless cars that they have in, in, at Google. So, I mean, again, there's an example of how things can go wrong. There recently was the incident where the car knocked down a pedestrian, you know, uh, on the Facebook premises. 
because what if something just goes a little bit haywire with the technology? Then the robot's brain goes. Yes, okay, human brains also go, but not at that extent. See, there's value in keeping to time. <laughs> then you have lots of questions. <laughs> Thank you for the wonderful interaction with us. Uh, I request Dr. D to join us here to acknowledge the work done by Dr. Darren. Thank you so much. Now we are heading towards uh, another interesting session. It is interesting not only because of the content, because immediately after this we will be having lunch. <laughs> so the chair for our next session is one of the very renowned professor, Sayed Akhtar Hussain, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. And, uh, <laughs> let me take over his, his this is the this is the I'm trying to save time to some, some some time i'm very happy uh, this talk actually is a very exciting because uh, it talks about cost sensitive decision tree learning i want to give you a brief about uh, this great speaker uh, professor shunil vadera he's a great guy uh, who is a renowned scientist uh, uh, I, I should i read out but because it's such a prolific uh, but just to mention few things because he is known to be a very renowned scientist fellow of British Computer Society a chartered engineer and uh, a chartered IT professional so you see him in a multiple hats uh, Shunil was awarded one of the renowned prestigious award video best UK British Indian scientist an engineer prize in the year 2014 and nothing but the last is that Amity University Research Award for Artificial Intelligence and Neural Networks in the year 2018. He has many years of accolades needless to read out perhaps you will listen to his uh, prolific uh, presentation today on uh, a very interesting topic and it's all about decision tree machine learning and uh, it's talking about cost sensitive yeah so let's enjoy let's give a big round of applause for professor shunil yeah to start his talk my friend you're there thank you for coming sorry, sorry. I hope you thank you very much thank you okay th thank you for staying uh, I know I'm keeping you from lunch. Okay. As I said, thank you for staying. I, I know I'm keeping you from lunch, so I will try and be as brief as possible, as quick as possible. <laughs> and thank you for that kind introduction and for the invitation from Amity and Professor Sunil to invite me uh, to, the, to present at this conference. So this will be, again, a very different... Uh, presentation from the wonderful presentation on uh, social interaction with robotics. I'm based at the University of Salford. Uh, most people don't know where U University of Salford is, but most people know where University of Manchester is, and most people know where Old Trafford is, Manchester United's football ground. This is based two miles away from Old Trafford. I'm just going to talk about one specific problem. Uh, you've heard this morning about the use of neural networks. Uh, it's obviously a common technology that's been applied for many years. Another common technology are decision trees, which are a little bit more transparent uh, as a, a way of learning, as a way of uh, explaining 
the classifications that are produced. So what's the problem that I'm going to talk about today? It's obviously a machine learning problem. And I'll start off with an introduction in case you don't know much about decision tree learning and then progress the idea fairly rapidly onto some of the classical works that have been done in uh, machine learning and decision tree learning. So it's like a, a tour if you want to get into this area to pursue research or to use the techniques this is, talk is a little bit of a quick uh, bird's eye tour of some of the work that has been done on cost sensitive learning and I will weave in some of the work that I've been uh, fortunate enough to be involved with. So to start with obviously what, what you're interested in is taking some training data, uh, pushing it through this decision tree learning algorithm and the kind of representation you get is something like this. So if you wanted to learn about which talk to attend and you had some data based on past talks, you could produce a decision tree like this from the learning algorithm, whether it's an interesting topic uh, and if it's a good abstract then you might consider it, if not, you might not consider it. So a decision tree is fairly transparent, you can look at it, you can present it to specialists and they can comment on it to point out the errors that might be there and then to improve it. So it's a technology that's been used for many, many years. So it really kick-started in, in the early 80s and uh, when Quinn Land developed something called C4.5 and an algorithm called C5 uh, to learn these decision trees. It's available in virtually all the toolkits that you have today. So if you look at something like Weka, uh, that includes this toolkit. If you use R, R includes this toolkit. Almost any toolkit that you have includes decision tree learning. So what's the, what's the challenge? Well, most people work on accuracy. So most people are interested in overall accuracy. So for decades, people have focused on measuring performance by looking at the overall accuracy of the algorithm on some test data after it's been trained on some training data. So why, why look at costs at all? And why look at cost sensitive data mining? I first got interested in uh, involve, including costs in machine learning in the 90s. I was approached by uh, an organization known as the Health and Safety Executive in the UK and what they were interested in is taking near miss data of chemical process plants and trying to predict whether there will be an explosion uh, uh, of the kind that occurred in Bhopal in uh, 84. So these uh, explosions can occur because of some chemical reaction or some mixture of uh, uh, material in the process and you get a buildup of pressure and the vessel ex explodes or you get a leak as we had in Bhopal and that ends up uh, killing people, injuring people in Bhopal. I think it's estimated well over 4,000 people were killed as a result of this kind of reaction. So anyway, we, we in the 80s and 90s, we tried to apply neural networks, we try to apply uh, decision tree learning methods, uh, the standard ones on this particular problem and it unfortunately didn't work. Despite all the uh, positive comments about those techniques, it didn't, didn't quite work. Uh, likewise, if you look at something like credit scoring, it doesn't quite work even for credit scoring, although you hear companies applying it, because in many of these cases the data is imbalanced and the cost of misclassification is imbalanced. So in, in the process uh, problem, the chemical uh, process engineering problem, if you misclassify an explosion as okay, that's quite a serious thing if the explosion occurs. If you compare to uh, misclassifying it as not okay. So it's imbalanced. It's imbalanced in terms of the data it's imbalanced in terms of the cost of the outcome. So this is quite a serious problem because many, most of the problems I've come across in practice are like that. The incidence of your positive class, you have few, few examples, maybe in dementia problem, maybe you also have the same problem, that you have few uh, people with dementia compared to the overall population. So the data is imbalanced, likewise misclassifying it results in a bigger cost. 
So hopefully you're convinced that cost is an important criteria that companies uh, and practical applications are interested in. So the problem is like this. If you, if you now formulate the problem, if you want to include costs, you need to include a cost matrix. A cost matrix like this that says if you're predicting something as uh, unsafe, when it's actually safe, the cost might be lowish. If you're predicting something is safe and it's actually unsafe, it's going to be a bigger cost, a lot bigger than uh, 900 units that I've talked about. The other issue that occurs in practice is the data is not necessarily available. Academics and many of the benchmarking trials people do, they have a nice set of data uh, in a matrix form or in a spreadsheet form. It's rarely the case in practice. Often you need to, ha there is a cost associated with getting the data. So clinicians have to package those tests to decide which costs to minimize or which tests to carry out. So you have to have a cost associated with the features or the tests that you carry out. So the problem now becomes not of simply maximizing accuracy, it becomes of max maximizing, uh, minimizing cost. The min minimizing the cost of classification, but also minimizing the cost of the tests that you need in practice. So that's the challenge. It's not a new challenge. And when you look at it, uh, and we did a survey about 2010 to 2013, and what you find is a full history of work in this area. And quite surprisingly, the very first algorithm that was developed, which was decades and decades ago by Hunt, which started this field, which is the root of this field, was as far back as in the 60s. Since then, it, it, it was quiet. People focused on accuracy. And then what happened was P uh, Quinlan came along, developed his ID3 algorithm, and then C4.5, uh, and the field then ex exploded. I'm going to take you through a tour of those algorithms. So those, that's the history, and the timeline of those algorithms. Well over 50 algorithms. I'm going to do a quick tour of those algorithms. Uh, before I do that, uh, can I just check how many of you are familiar with decision trees? If you stick your hand up. Okay, so I'm going to do it. Yeah. Okay, so it's quite a few. I'm going to do a quick introduction to decision trees to give you the context. So suppose you've got some examples like this. Uh, it's based on, an, based on a larger set of data where people are recruiting programmers. And you want to learn whether to invite somebody to an interview or not. So the first, uh, uh, at the top, you've got the column headings. So we've got programming, communication ability, presentation. And in the final column, you've got the decision. And you want to learn a decision tree. How do you learn a decision tree? Well, you know the structure. You've got to pick a, a root node. So you pick a root node. Suppose you pick presentation as the root node. You take your challenge is to produce a tree that is consistent with the data. So you take the, root, the examples, you drop it through the root node, and you look at the potential answers for presentations, which are neat, fair, and scruffy. So un under the neat example, you've just got example one, which has got a decision yes. So you can terminate that to a yes. Under the fair category, you've got examples two, four, and nine. And under the scruffy example, you've got a mixture of examples at 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 10. The answers, if you look at 2, 4, and 9, example 2, the outcome is yes. Example 4, the outcome is no. So it's not reached the end, so you ask another question. And you work the process through like that. So that gives you a tree now. The tree is consistent with the table of examples because you took all the examples, dropped them through, you didn't lose any of the examples, and you're consistent with the outcome. I deliberately chose presentation as the root. You could quite easily have chosen another question. So if you choose programming, you get this kind of tree coming out. You, again, following the same process, you come out with a different tree. It's a top-down greedy procedure. Okay. 
So you've got a different tree coming out. Notice, notice you've got uh, on the present on the programming. If somebody is uh, poor at programming, they're rejected. Whereas if you looked at the previous tree, if somebody somebody is neat, they're accepted. So remember, both trees are consistent with the table of examples. Suppose we have this guy now. He's neat. He's a poor programmer. Obviously, tree one, because he's neat, says yes. Tree two, because he's a poor programmer, says no. So the table of examples was consistent. The, the two trees are consistent with the tables of examples, yet the answers are different. So what Quinlan did, which was great, was to say, which question do I ask first? And that was the insight that he provided the field. And he said that the, he said, really you should choose the question based on the amount of information you get from each of the questions. And luckily, uh, Shannon has developed a measure which enables you to work out which question gives you the most information. And based on entropy, he was able to then deliver, uh, work out which question to ask next. So Quinlan was able to do that and you get a tree like this. And then followed a lot of work on choosing the metric that gives you the most information. So many people tried chi-squared, some people tried other variations to choose the question next. So it turns out that Quinlan was, Quinlan's insight was pretty good and when people did empirical evaluations, those results were better than the other uh, methods that uh, other people tried. So you get a good tree by using that measure. So the question then is, that's a standard greedy top-down accuracy-based algorithm. How do you in include costs? So the first phase of work occurred on, on, in an obvious way. If you've got this measure, it doesn't include costs. How do I introduce costs? Well, in, in, include the costs somehow in that measure. Put the cost measure in there. And that's what people tried. First of all, so the first phase of work uh, was around costs being amended to be included in the, in the measures. So if you had algorithms such as EG2, I don't know whether you can see that, but EG2, you had the information gain measure and you've got the cost included. Obviously, the, the two are in op opposing each other. So you, you divide by the cost, the total cost of an attribute. Uh, there are other algorithms you'll find in the literature by Tan and Schimler uh, that did the same. Unfortunately, if you take that approach, and a lot of people did, you can see the numbers of publication, it doesn't quite work. It just did not work. People did empirical trials, and it didn't work. So what followed was a generation of work on using genetic algorithms. We heard a little bit earlier about uh, genetic algorithms to do that. Uh, I'm going to talk you through those ideas. And the best paper that used genetic algorithms at the time was by Turney. It was in 95. And this is the way it worked. It, it took the data set. It used uh, genes which were biases of the cost, they weren't the actual cost, and by using genetic algorithms, it was able to apply an existing decision tree learning algorithm with the biases to gen generate multiple decision trees. So the key thing here is the genes used biases of the parameters. So most of these algorithms have parameters, uh, as well as cost, you have the amount of pruning that's done in the decision tree. So there's a parameter for pruning, and what it did was use those as biases to generate, uh, apply a decision tree learning algorithm with those parameters to generate multiple trees. Those multiple trees were then assessed with a fitness function and the process repeated in the usual manner using genetic algorithms until eventually you get the fittest tree. So this is the work, work of Turney that was done. And for many years, that was the gold standard. If you looked at the number of citations that, of this particular paper by Turney, which was published in the Journal of AI uh, Research, it's an online journal, 
you'll find the number of citations huge for this particular piece of work, quite rightly so. The, the difficulty was that when we did a trial of that work, we came back to read Turney's paper, we noticed an important statement by, by Turney. What Turney said was it's easier to avoid false positive diagnosis than it is to avoid false negatives. Unfortunately for us, false negatives usually cost you more because obviously if you diagnose a patient as healthy when they're sick, that's a lot more serious. So although Tony's work was highly cited, is very good work, actually it has a major weakness and people had given up on that work. People have assumed the problem is solved. It wasn't solved at all. We did some trials and what we tried to do was to go by uh, this statement that everything should be made as simple as possible but not simpler. And we went by that statement and we went back to what Turney did. And this is what Turney did and we said, how can we simplify this? Can it get any simpler? And what we said was, okay, what Turney has done here is used existing algorithms which produce the trees based on accuracy and those are biased by the parameters of those algorithms. So what we said, we can simplify this by taking that out. We can take that, that bit out completely. And we said, why don't we go to the true principles of a genetic algorithm and say, okay, we're going to have trees. And we're going to code those trees for our genetic algorithm. So we did that. And surprisingly, we got back to the simple genetic algorithm, coded trees directly, and our results were a lot better. The way we coded trees is just the way you would code trees, which is to uh, get the attributes or the features and give each feature a number and then code those as a, as a string. And then, of course, we didn't do anything clever because we wanted to keep it simple. We used the standard mutation uh, and the standard operators for crossover, so we didn't try and tune them, we just use them as they were. Of course, when you do this, you can occasionally come up with a tree that's not a proper tree, and you have to fix that. And of course, once you've got the evolved tree, once you've got the evolved tree, you can use the data to allocate the costs. So you can take the data, drop them through the tree, and you get the, the classification at the bottom of the tree. And this produced remarkably better results. Okay? So the, tr the results we got, we did the usual empirical trials that you would expect. Uh, we made one mistake. We varied the, varied the costs. Is that finished or have I got five minutes? Have I got five minutes? Okay. Okay, so I got good results. And then we, of course, looked at uh, the next generation of methods was by Metacost. So if you're working in this field, Metacost is one of the benchmark date uh, algorithms that you will do. Again, um, the idea with Metacost is interesting. Uh, bagging and boosting were mentioned earlier, were mentioned. So what Metacost does is generates n samples, and then from each sample it generates a tree. Uh, it combines those and it does some relabeling. Eventually it produces one tree, one cost sensitive tree. Uh, again, here's a nice quote by the father of chaos theory. Uh, it's basically, it's saying, basically, it's saying people tend to work, people tend to assume that something is done and dusted and solved. Something is done and dusted and solved when it actually isn't. People move on in the field far quickly. And we, we, what we did was we looked at decision trees if you look at the decision trees you're using in things like Weka and existing packages, they all have one major error or one major issue in them. They use what are known as axis parallel splits. So if you look at the nodes, if you give it that problem, if you give it that problem, which is not an unusual kind of configuration where you've got one class in the center, you've got things around it, you get that tree which intuitively is not right, is it? I mean, intuitively it's wrong. 
it does produce good accuracy, but it, intuitively it's wrong. For cost sensitive, that doesn't work. What you want to do is you want to produce, you want to use discriminant analysis to produce a nonlinear single tree with a single node. So using that concept, we, we produce nonlinear decision trees. So the nodes of the trees are now nonlinear. They're not axis parallel like you'll find in the packages. And the results, again, are great compared to Turney's work. If you go back to Turney's work, you'll get that. So I've got two minutes, I know, so I'm going to finish. Having done that and tried that, was looking for further improvements, and the further improvements is when you've tried everything else and you're tired, you resort to gambling. Uh, I don't gamble, but uh, there's some wonderful thing called game theory. And what we used was something called multi arm bandits. So the idea with multi arm bandits is imagine yourself in a casino. You've got these bandits. You've got some money. You're going to put the money in, in one or two bandits. Some will give you a reward. Others will not. Your problem is to choose the next bandit. And the, ta the big problem is, over a period of time, you want to choose the next bandit so that when you finish, you maximize your rewards at the end. And you don't regret choosing the wrong bandits. Okay? So there's a lot of nice theory around multi arm bandits. And what's what, that's what we use. So we use... Whew, that was loud. This is uh, trying selecting an, an attribute and then running that through the decision tree to find a path. Each path will have a, a reward and a cost. And if you do that enough times, you can work out which attribute to choose. So again, very different from entropy, but based on cost. And that work we published uh, a few years ago, 2017, uh, and again, produced good results. I'm going to finish with this conclusion, which kind of captures what we've been trying to do. We've been trying to do things differently. When the bagging and boosting people were saying the problem was solved, we said, no, no, it's not solved with bagging and boosting. We need to look at it differently. So we used uh, nonlinear decision trees, which produce better results. So if we'd stuck with bagging and boosting being the best, we wouldn't have made the advance that we made. So I very much kind of say that if you follow the crowd, you're going to end up where the crowd is. If you try and do something different, you might end up in a different place. Okay, I'm going to finish there. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Yeah, so it was a great presentation. And uh, since we are running behind time, we may invite at least two questions for this uh, great speaker. Yeah, uh, any two questions on the cost and Amazing. I, I have a lot of questions, but I will talk to you later. And uh, maybe we invite one or two questions from the. Yes, please, Mario. Thank you. Very interesting presentation, Professor. One question: This kind of a uh, kind of uh, strategy could be applied to the real-time data processing. To real-time data processing. Real-time. Yeah. Um, most, most of the applications we've you, tried it on are things like credit scoring. Um, we haven't really, so credit scoring, uh, we'll, we haven't really tried the applications in, in real time. But remember, once you learn the decision tree, the processing is very fast anyway. Uh, there's an algorithm called Anytime Decision Tree Learning. There's an Israeli group. Uh, Escher, I think is his name, an Israeli group that has done any time processing. So the idea there is to learn as you acquire data, and what you try and do is you, have a, uh, you take a decision in real time that is good enough. You don't wait. So it's a challenge to know how long you wait to collect enough data to get a, a good enough decision. Not necessarily the best decision, but a good enough decision. Uh, thank you very much. We uh, put a big round of uh, applause. Uh, uh, let us give a big hand to Professor Shunel. Yes, wonderful. And it's time for felicitations. So uh, let me uh, 
invite Professor. Uh, may, I also may I also request Dr. Ajana sir to kindly join us uh, here. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Mr. Amit, Dr. Lakshmi Ahuja, yes. Dr. Archana, please come forward. Thank you so much for including cost into your efficient training. You had a little bit of less time. Yeah, I had to go quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I need to make a quick thank announcement you. for premier in guest. Uh, there are 12 guests who have opted uh, not for joining the tour. Shuttle bus is waiting for them. And uh, yeah, I need to tell your names. Like you have in the list, we have Professor Sunil Vadera, Ozawa Kenzi, Ye Nong, Cloeza Whiteley. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sri Nivas Singh, SN Singh, and Arazua Carmen Paz, Hu Yu Zong, Baksi Brian Andrew, Altani Ahmed, and Ofid Ahmed. Ahmed Afak, Valerio, Valerio Pasuji, Dia Zia uh, Day. And uh, everyone, uh, lunch is served. Please proceed for the lunch.